Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today, I interview a really fascinating and unconventional inventor who is likely to be both entertaining and informative for most subscribers out there. Before that, this is the show's 50th episode, and it's going to come out around New Year. So I thought it was a good moment to take a minute to reflect on the year that's passed and where we're going next year. To be honest with you, it's just an incredible privilege to be able to run a show like this. Thanks to our donors, Kieran and I are really spared from the commercial pressures that would otherwise drive us to produce content that's superficial or dumbed down or misleading in some ways in order to get clicks. Instead, we can just try to produce episodes that we find sincerely interesting and informative ourselves. As a result, and uh, thanks to people like you recommending this show to their friends, we've progressively been able to build up an incredibly highbrow audience. Many of you I either meet or get messages from, and, and the feedback shows both how much you enjoy listening to this show and the really close attention that many of you are paying to, to each one of these interviews. We've produced 95 hours of the show so far and featured 36 guests in 2018. I can see from our analytics which episodes you're most excited to download and which ones people actually stick with listening. And whenever Kieran and I worry that an interview might have gone too deep into a topic or just be too complicated to hold people's attention, we found the exact reverse to actually be the case. If there's a level of intellectual challenge that's uh, too much for you all, we haven't hit it yet. So I hope next year we can continue to have ever more sophisticated conversations about these topics that we all care about. I guess now with the knowledge that we've covered a lot of the basics already. The second reason we appreciate all of you listeners is your really sincere commitment to improving the world. Thanks to our annual impact survey, I've been able to read about how many of you are either seriously considering or or already have totally changed your careers on the basis of what you've learned listening to the show. It's really an an honor to be in the position to to help some of the world's smartest and, and most caring people have more social impact with their lives. It's also a relief, I guess, to know that this show is not only enjoyable to people, but is making a, a real contribution to solving some really horrifying problems that we, uh, that we talk about on here. So I hope you'll stick with us into 2019 and that uh, Kieran and I will continue to be able to find guests that can entertain, inform, and, and hopefully inspire you as well. All right, with that out of the way, I bring you the eclectic engineer, Dr. Dave Denkenberger. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. David Denkenberger. He did his undergraduate in engineering science from Penn State before doing a master's at Princeton in mechanical and aerospace engineering and a PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder in their buildings systems program. He's now an assistant professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in mechanical engineering. He co-founded and directs the Alliance to Feed the Earth in Disasters, otherwise known as AllFed, and donates half of his income to it. He's authored or co-authored 85 publications with over 1,100 citations, including the book Feeding Everyone No Matter What, Managing Food Security After a Global Catastrophe. His food security work has been widely covered in the media, including in Science, Discovery Channel Online, and Gizmodo. But most importantly of all, he's a regular listener to the 80,000 Hours podcast. Thanks for coming on the show, Dave. Hi, Rob. Thanks for having me. We plan to talk about the case for and against working on your approach to feeding the world in, in the case of a major catastrophe. Uh, I don't know that at the top of the show, you wanted to clarify and disclaim that uh, all of the things you say here are just your opinion and uh, not the official views of All Fed or the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute or, or any other group that you've been uh, working with. First, though, uh, just describe for listeners what All Fed actually does and, and why you think it's such important work. Well, the background is that there are a number of catastrophes that could disrupt agriculture globally. And the most extreme ones could basically collapse agriculture. These are ones that could block the sun. So they include a large asteroid, like that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, a super volcanic eruption, like almost many people think caused the extinction of humans about 70,000 years ago, and uh, a nuclear winter. And this would be caused by what's called full-scale nuclear war involving thousands of nuclear weapons between the U.S. and Russia. And... This causes burning of cities and smoke goes into the atmosphere and it can remain there for a decade. And so in in these scenarios, since almost all of our food comes from plants that need the sun to grow, uh, it's generally assumed that that most people would die. Uh, We only have a few months of, of food storage and people who have looked at this problem before have suggested, well, let's just store up more food. Uh, and that would be technically possible, but As a way of visualizing it, you can think of a 120 liter or 40 gallon oil drum. If that's full of dry food, that can feed a person for a year. But to have enough food to feed 7 billion people, 
for five years, you would need to pile those drums from the Earth to the moon and back 40 times. So as you can imagine, that would be very expensive, many trillions of dollars, and you can't do it really fast. It would take a while to store up that food, but you would want to do it as fast as practical so that you're ready to to weather disasters that could happen at any time. Uh, but if you store it up fast, then you inflate the food price, and then millions of people more would die of malnutrition than, than already occurs. I wasn't satisfied with that uh, not very good solution. So I was thinking, well, is there another way of producing food when the sun is blocked? And 2011, I was reading this paper called Fungi and Sustainability, and the premise was that after the dinosaur killing asteroid, there would not have been sunlight and there were lots of dead trees. And so mushrooms could grow really well. But its conclusion was that maybe when humans go extinct, the world will be ruled by mushrooms again. But I thought, why don't we just eat the mushrooms and not go extinct? And so then I branched out from mushrooms, thinking of all the ways that we could convert either dead vegetation into food or even fossil fuels into food. Is anyone else working on this? Has anyone else had this idea that seems kind of obvious in retrospect? Well, interestingly, uh, Carl Schulman at uh, Future of Humanity Institute did a, a blog post as soon after I thought of these ideas before I published the first paper in the book. So yeah, he, he was thinking that, that route. But other than that, it, it seems like it, it really hasn't been thought about. Yeah, so I just love this idea, Wh whether it's practical or not. Um, I'm, just, I'm just so fond of it because you've taken... Uh, kind of a problem that most people have just thought of as inevitable and basically accepted that if this is a nuclear war, then maybe billions of people will die of starvation. And I guess bringing, bringing an engineering mindset that, that you've been trained in, you've just seen this as a practical challenge to overcome and pr pretty quickly come up with a bunch of seemingly plausible ways that we could actually just feed everyone, even if the sun were, were completely blocked out, which is, uh, which is amazing. Yeah, that's right. And I do think that that, that engineering mindset is, is really important in that you know, certainly it's important to know what the problems are and ideally prevent them, but realistically they still could happen. And mm. so I think that there should be more work done on this, uh, this resilience end of the spectrum. Yeah. So you've uh, written some blog posts and in fact, I think published a paper now trying to estimate the cost effectiveness of working on this problem. And uh, I think you, you think that uh, if your cost effectiveness is correct, you would be able to save lives by working on um, feeding people in these catastrophes uh, for either tw between 20 cents and $400 uh, per life, which would be uh, pr pretty, pretty extraordinarily effective uh, if, it, if it were true. I suspect that that's probably uh, a bit a bit too over optimistic, although uh, the project is probably worth doing anyway, even if it's not not quite as effective as that. And uh, I guess we'll we'll discuss um, the, the cost effectiveness analysis later and which parts of it might be um, too optimistic or, or not optimistic enough, perhaps. But first, maybe let's let's just dive into thinking about the the nature of the problem that you're solving and and the and the, the concrete solutions that you've come up with for it. So not all listeners, I imagine, will be convinced that kind of a mass starvation of humanity is a terribly likely risk. Uh, so let's go through um, what are the major possible causes of uh, a global food shortage and, and, and how likely might they be? So I mentioned asteroid and supervolcano, but uh, as the existential risk community has pointed out, generally the, the natural catastrophes can't be that bad um, because they have, you know, they can't be happening every century or we would have uh, been doomed uh, long ago. Though, of course, there is the possibility that we've been extremely lucky, which uh, people have have tried to adjust for. But I think still, even adjusting for that, the, the natural catastrophes are lower probability. Do we have any estimate of the probability of, of a, um, an asteroid or supervolcano that would, that would cause a, a risk to human food supply? Yeah, if you're talking about blocking the sun, then it, it really is around one in, uh, I think, 10 million years or 100 million years for an asteroid. And the volcano is, is more likely more like one in a hundred thousand or a million years. How, how robust are those estimates? Because I know we've had a couple of uh, volcanoes uh, erupt and change change the biosphere during the million years or so that humanity has been around. Yes, the latest estimate I saw on the supervolcanoes was actually coming up with a larger number that it, that they happen more frequently. Apparently, it's uh, difficult to identify further back than a few million years. So there's some uncertainty there. There's also uncertainty whether the supervolcanic eruption would actually block the sun well enough and, and long enough to cause mass starvation. Mm -hmm. And so that's 
it's the same with nuclear war as well. And I, I've written a, a paper that tries to go through all the uncertainties of, well, how many nuclear weapons would be detonated? You know, which cities would be hit? What fraction of the combustible material actually burns quickly? How much of that turns into smoke? How much of that smoke makes it into the upper atmosphere? And how much do the particles block the sun? And then how much does it impact agriculture? And mm. as you can imagine, there's uncertainty in all of those steps. So mm. it, it adds up. Yeah, it, it seems like there's this question of how bad nuclear winter would be or how likely it is to happen is, is pretty controversial. There seems to be people who have strong views on both sides. Have you had a chance to, to really dive into that and form a, a strong view? Well, I, I did dive into it in, in the course of writing that paper. And yeah, I, I think you're right that there seems to be two camps. One is if there's full-scale nuclear war, there's going to be nuclear winter. And the other camp is, even if there is full-scale nuclear war, there's not going to be nuclear winter. Hmm. And what I came up with was, well, defining it as global agricultural collapse, hmm. which means basically the plants we're growing now, where they are, are not going to be able to grow. Now, we'll get into whether we might be able to move them or not, but, but if we just use that definition, then I was getting around 20% chance uh, if full-scale nuclear war, then you would have global agricultural collapse. But one reason mine was relatively low compared to many analysts was because I considered a scenario, two scenarios that wouldn't be quite as bad that might mm. still be described as, as full-scale nuclear war. One of those is called the uh, industrial strike, mm. where you're trying to disable industry but not trying to kill people. And the other one is the counter-force strike, where you're trying to disable the other person's nuclear weapons. And so both of those, you're not hitting city centers, and so the, the fires would not be as bad. Do you know what the, the crux of the debate is about you know, how is it that people can disagree so much about whether a nuclear winter is, is likely? Well, I think it's because just there are so many levels of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, people point out in World War II, one of the cities had a firestorm, which is defined as a, a stationary fire. The entire uh, city burns at once. Mm -hmm. And one of them had a mass fire but didn't all burn at once. And this actually affects the how much of the smoke actually goes into the upper atmosphere. Hmm. So that's one example of uncertainty. But, but yeah, there's just, it's kind of like the Fermi paradox. You know, uh, when you calculate how many civilizations are in our galaxy, some people have come up with zero and some people have come up with millions, right? <laughs> so there's, there's just huge uncertainty. But at least in, in this case, I think the uncertainty can be more like two or three orders of magnitude. And so you can actually say something useful when comparing things. Okay, so what about the more moderate cases where, say there's a, there's a more normal war or, an, or only a regional uh, nuclear war? Um, how much would that interfere with the food supply? So that's the class of catastrophes that I've been labeling the order of magnitude 10% global food production shortfall. Mm -hmm. So roughly like 33% loss to 30% loss. And in those scenarios, there, there are a number of catastrophes that could cause that. As you mentioned, uh, regional nuclear war, like between India and Pakistan, that might only involve 100 total nuclear weapons and actually much smaller nuclear weapons than the U.S. and Russia have. But still, they would be targeted at highly populated cities. Mm -hmm. And so some, some work on this has estimated something like a, a 10 or 20 percent global food production shortfall because of it. Then you can think of smaller versions of the natural catastrophes like asteroid and supervolcano, but again, they're not too likely. But another one that's received some interest recently is called the coincident extreme weather uh, or multiple breadbasket failure. So here the scenario is you have droughts or floods on multiple continents at once. There was a UK government study on this that estimated right now it might be around 1% chance per year. But uh, with the slow climate change, that extreme weather probability, so difference between climate and weather, actually gets, gets more likely. And so they were getting more like 80% chance uh, this century that something like that would happen. Wow, okay. And then there, there are other scenarios as well, like uh, the, the super weed, which is not the savior of medicinal marijuana users, <laughs> uh, but is instead a, a weed that outcompetes crops. Now, if this were a natural thing, we could probably contain it or at least slow it down so that it wouldn't happen too fast. And if we have more time in any of these, it, it makes it less extreme. But it could be an actual coordinated terrorist attack. And there have been some examples of um, people trying to use, I think that was more a crop disease, 
But that's another category. You know, something that would kill crops directly could be a coordinated attack as well. So a super weed sounds a bit outlandish because because how would a weed spread all around the world uh, re- really quickly? It seems like w- wouldn't wouldn't a super pathogen like a virus or or a bacteria be be more able to to, to spread to to lots of crops? Um, you know, qu- quickly enough that it's hard to respond. Yeah, right. Uh, it's it's hard to have something that that can live in in many different climates. Yeah, I'm particularly worried about on the the crop disease. If something could target the grass family, mm. then you affect not just grass that feeds a lot of our animals, but also wheat, corn, maize, uh, rice, and sugarcane. So mm. if you add up all of the human calories, it's something like two-thirds of our calories comes from the, the grass family. So mm. that really could be catastrophic. You mention in the book that a coordinated terrorist attack using super weeds to destroy a lot of crops uh, across a really large uh, region could be a global threat that not that many people are uh, thinking about. Do you have any evidence that a, that a group might actually plan such an attack or, or has been considering planning such an attack? And do you know if anyone else is, uh, is working on trying to figure out if this, is a, if this is a real risk and what might be done? I, I have not heard of evidence for this particular type of risk, though a related one is uh, crop diseases. And, and these have been used in biological warfare programs. So there is concern that, that this could be a a potentially larger attack. As for the probabilities, I haven't seen anything quantitative. And so I just try to quantify what I can and then say, well, we're not including all these other things. So really the risk is higher. Are there any just non-nuclear wars that you think would, would create this scenario that, that that are plausible? I mean, yeah, who could end up fighting without nuclear weapons? And it, and it would, I mean, if you had a if you had a major war, wouldn't that massively interfere with trade? And so some countries that are currently importing most of their food could could well end up starving pretty fast. That's right. Uh, And the other scenario that could really uh, interfere with trade is a pandemic. If it were a severe one, then it may be rational to close borders to reduce transmission. Mm -hmm. But you're right, importing food countries would be in big trouble. Or it could be a smaller pandemic and it just people overreact. So it might not be rational, but they still might close, close the borders. There are a couple other scenarios that could do uh, similar to this idea of a, of a 10% global shortfall. Yeah. Uh, one of them is called abrupt climate change. So mm. this is like uh, Europe going back into the ice age, uh, which some people have, have talked about uh, because of breakdown of the thermal haline circulation, circulation of the ocean that's uh, driven by salt. That could be a 10% shortfall. And an- another one that people have have talked about and some some existential risk researchers are looking at is uh, extreme climate change. So it's global, but it still happens slowly, like over a century. And that's a little different than the problems I'm mainly focusing on. But I think some of the ideas could could be relevant to that. Yeah, I guess. I mean, people worry about us just not having enough food over the next century because populations growing quickly and maybe food technology won't keep up. Do, do you think just a food shortfall, uh, even setting aside any disasters, is, is also a serious risk? Well, I, I think it is important to look at. But generally, if the, if the shortfall happens slowly, we have time to react. And, and for the smaller shortfalls, you could always say, well, technically, we feed more than 10% of the food we produce to animals now. So mm-hmm. why don't we just feed it to people? Well, yes, that's true. But in reality, people in developed countries like to eat meat, uh, many of them. And so I think the, the food price would go so high that you could easily have hundreds of millions of people uh, starve. And so that's a particular concern if it happens suddenly. If we have more time, I think there are other things we, we can do. Okay, so let's say that you had uh, yeah, this kind of 10% shortfall of food scenario. Uh, how bad do you think that would be? Would, would just, you know, some people would die, but, but the rest of us would carry on? So I wrote a paper about this as well. And again, very large uncertainty of what could happen. If we had a massive outpouring of philanthropic work, uh, we could really limit how many people die. Uh, But on the other end, we could not just have hundreds of millions of people dying, but then tensions could be very high. And you could imagine nuclear war breaking out, even full-scale nuclear war. Uh, So I think it has a pretty fat tail that uh, the impacts could be really bad. Hmm. Why would people start a nuclear war just because there wasn't enough food? Well, if people are actually starving, like if if only a certain number of people are going to survive, you want the people in your country to survive. Mm. And so it is actually in your interest uh, to have conflict. This is kind of the lifeboat ethic. And this is exactly what I want to get away from uh, with 
having alternate food supplies so that we could say, well, actually, if we cooperate, we can feed everyone. We don't have to have this lifeboat ethic. Ah, so, so, so the idea is you would be happy to fight a war that resulted in the deaths of other people because then there'll be more food left for you. Yeah, that's the logic. Even, even though the war presumably would interfere with agriculture to an even greater degree? Uh, well, if it's nuclear, yes, potentially. And I'm not saying this is what I would recommend, but <laughs> you know, how, uh, there's always the possibility of uh, irrational decisions. Okay, so uh, we've got kind of asteroids and supervolcanoes that would create a serious problem. Most people would probably agree with that, but that they're, they're quite unlikely each year. We've got a uh, nuclear winter, uh, which seems a bunch more likely, although uh, a bit hard. We don't know exactly how likely it is because we don't have a long historical record. And, and there's a bit of uncertainty about uh, how severe the, the um, weather effects would be, but we certainly can't rule it out. Then we've got a whole lot of other uh, more moderate scenarios that create you know, a 10% or something shortfall uh, in, in food output, which then could cascade into other problems, including you know, super weeds or super, super pathogens or uh, you know, sudden, sudden weather changes or, or just bad luck with the weather or um, more, more moderate-sized wars. And altogether, you think this adds up to a significant risk to humanity as a whole, like some, something that we should be worried about. That's right. Okay, and then who's, who's working on this problem? Uh, I guess there's some people who try to stockpile food, and presumably some, some countries have uh, food stored away. Yeah, how, how much is there, and uh, what else are people trying to do? Well, there are certain countries that have, have done a lot of food stockpiling. One of them is Switzerland. I believe they have around a one-year food supply. Uh, I think China does as well, though it's not not public knowledge, uh, so you don't know exactly. But on average, it's more like a few months across the world. And you'll often hear numbers of, you know, we have two months of grain supply. That's actually about right, but for the wrong reasons. So it's at current grain consumption, but of course we feed half of our grain to animals. So if we did have one of these catastrophes, hopefully we would be not feeding as much edible food to animals. Mm. So that helps. But there's also the fact that most of our stored food is grain because it's really easy to store dried. And half of our calories comes from food that is not grain. And so we have less food storage uh, that is not grain. So it works out to, to just a few months of, of food storage. And it depends on uh, what time of the year, but that's the minimum. So, so currently we get, you were saying about two thirds of our calories from, from grains of various kinds? Yeah. So that is when you count direct consumption and food going into animals. Ah, okay. And the other third is what, uh, fruits and vegetables and fish and things like that? Right. And there are, I mean, there's debate about whether soybean is a grain or not, not <laughs> but it's a, a staple. And But yeah, basically fruits, vegetables, and what other things? Nuts. Nuts. Okay. Yeah. Um, oils, maybe. Yeah. Uh, is, is there anyone else who's trying to work on feeding the world in these disaster scenarios using something other than just storage? I'm, I'm not aware of anyone else. Okay. <laughs> so it's just you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, all fed. Luckily, I have a team. Okay. okay so let's move on to talking about uh, some of the solutions uh, to, to this problem. If we had a major nuclear winter and people hadn't really planned ahead uh, any way of dealing with this and they start running out on, of food stores... Uh, what things might uh, people start doing? And what, what have they done in the past when, when they've been starving? Well, it's, it's been really terrible. Uh, I've heard stories of uh, people in the, I think, Irish potato famine uh, boiling boots because it was made of leather and they could get some calories out of them. Uh, I've heard of people eating grass straight, but it has so much fiber that you actually don't get any um, net calories. It's kind of like eating uh, 100% celery. So the, the options are, are really limited. But related to the, the eating grass, there has been a, a, a technique to extract edible calories out of leaves where you grind up the leaves and squeeze out the liquid uh, so that you, you get rid of the fiber, basically, that we can't digest. And then you boil that liquid and the, a protein concentrate comes to the surface. Hmm. And what is left over in the liquid is actually a lot of the toxins that aren't good for us. And so this has already been done at the small scale in less developed countries, and it's even been done on the industrial scale in France. So that's, that's kind of a, a next step of, of making some of the uh, existing biomass directly edible for people. But that doesn't get you very far. Well, you might only get 10% of the, the calories total in, in the leaves as human food. And it sounds like, I mean, wouldn't there be a lot of uh, actual uh, manual labor that would go into digesting it 
and, uh, and and extracting it such that is, is it even clear that you'd come out ahead? So to, to back up about these catastrophes, many people will assume that if there's nuclear war, then our entire industrial infrastructure is would be collapsed. Hmm. And that may very well be true in the countries that are hit directly hmm. by the nuclear weapons. But say it's a, a U.S.-Russia exchange, that might be 20% of the global industrial infrastructure. Hmm. So from a global perspective, I would say the majority of infrastructure would still be functioning. And so I think there is potential to retrofit our industrial infrastructure to producing food. And I actually use the analogy from uh, World War II, where before the war, U.S. was hardly producing any airplanes. But once it entered the war, it retrofitted its automobile manufacturing plants to produce airplanes and tanks, and was, was able to do that in a very short amount of time. And so I think it's feasible to look at our chemical processing plants and retrofit them to produce food. One of the ways of doing that would be looking at how we produce biofuels right now. We're all familiar with uh, first-generation biofuels where we turn corn or soybeans into transport fuel. But the second-generation biofuels or the cellulosic biofuels take the corn stalk and break it into sugar with enzymes and then feed that sugar to a fungus to make ethanol. But if our problem is not having enough food, it may be possible to eat that sugar directly. Interesting. Okay. So it sounds like uh, you're, you're more focused on the countries that, that haven't been directly affected by the disaster because that's a somewhat more solvable problem. So if there's a, a nuclear war in the Northern Hemisphere or hopefully an asteroid hits the Northern Hemisphere, then you can think about, or what, what could New Zealand and Australia and Chile and Brazil do that could, that could plausibly save almost everyone in those countries? Yeah, it, it's certainly easier. So... Basically, the, the unifying uh, idea in, in this book, uh, Feeding Everyone uh, no, no Matter What, is that even if the sun goes away, there's actually just a ton of chemical energy stored on the, on the Earth's surface in the form of kind of wood and soil and, and other materials. The thing is, humans can't eat those. So we have to find some way of converting all of that chemical energy into something that humans can then digest easily. Um, and then, That's right. And then I guess you're going through various different options for doing that. Right. So there are quite a few options for the leaves. Uh, that we've talked about, the cellulose digesting animals like cows, sheep, goats, rabbits can digest, then we could also, like we said, turn them into sugar in an industrial process. Then wood is actually more difficult, but mushrooms can grow directly on wood. So you can get mushrooms from wood and they can soften the wood and that leftover from the wood can actually be fed to cows, sheep and goats um, hmm. and bison. That's That's actually already been done. So you're right. It's just a matter of turning this big energy resource into something that's actually human edible. Yeah. Do, do we know what the denominator there is? How much, how much chemical energy is there in, in wood and other things like that? It's very large. And so in, in the book, I look at what if we were trying to get all of our food from just one of these food sources, uh, which in reality, we'd be getting food from multiple sources, but just, to, just as a first analysis. And the only one that we actually would run out of feedstock or energy source was uh, outdoor mushrooms growing on logs, that they're so inefficient that we would actually run out. Huh. But, but many, many of these, it's, you really could feed everyone for five years. Wow. Okay. W where is all of this biomass? Is it just out in forests that I don't really see? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, contrary to popular belief, there still are forests left. And yeah, it's, uh, it's I think, hundreds of gigatons of, of biomass. Okay, uh, so let's maybe go through uh, the, the main options that you canvas in the book. So uh, we've got mushrooms, uh, which can grow on, yeah, just uh, plant plant matter. I guess we, we've already talked about cows, uh, but there's other potential things that could, that could eat these materials, like insects and rats. There's trying to just digest them with enzymes, I guess, in, in, in big vats and cook them effectively. And then there's th this other method of uh, growing bacteria on, on fossil fuels or finding a way to, gr to, to, to grow something that humans can eat using fossil fuels. Let's maybe just do mushrooms first. Do you, do you want to describe some, of the, some more of the details of that? So you can, you can grow mushrooms just on a log outside, mm. but that's limited because it's only in the tropics that would not be freezing. So I, I'm mm. basing my uh, work on climate simulation of nuclear winter where the global temperature reduction is around seven or eight degrees Celsius. So in large areas, at least in the tropics, it would actually not freeze. So you could potentially grow mushrooms outdoors. It turns out it would be very difficult to ship hundreds of billions of tons of wood 
from the mid latitudes outside the tropics into the tropics. So I don't actually uh, consider that option. But we could do some growing of mushrooms indoors. We would probably do it on the leaves because that can be converted to mushrooms very quickly. And so you can get more, more mushrooms per growing area. And people could potentially have racks of mushrooms in their basement. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go out and harvest wood and plants and things like that and then grow then grow mushrooms on them. Can the mushrooms grow quickly enough? And how much kind of space would you need to grow this many mushrooms? Because, I mean, mushrooms aren't that calorie dense. So it seems like we'd have to convert basically, well, I guess eyeballing it, it seems like we'd have to convert an enormous amount of all of our building space and all of our work into just growing mushrooms. Yeah. I think if we were getting all of our food from mushrooms, I might have estimated in the book, it would take a third of our building square footage, which would be a huge impact. But again, we're going to be getting food from a number of different sources. So it wouldn't be all from mushrooms in our basements. Yeah. Okay. So this is just one option. Yep. Hold on. So, so, so the problem with mushrooms is that you can't really grow them outside because it gets too cold? Uh, outside of the tropics, right. Okay. Uh, so for Australia, this isn't, this isn't really going to work. Maybe it would work in Indonesia or something. Yeah. Are there any other weaknesses of the, of the mushroom approach? Well, as you said, they're, they're not very calorie dense. They're actually pretty high percent protein mm. uh, by calorie. But there, there is a lot of water. Uh, but it would be feasible to get enough calories if you ate enough mushrooms. But I did write a paper on the nutrition of alternate foods. And I found to meet the United States recommended daily allowance, you would need a mixture of basically all 10 of these foods. But to do just what people could survive on, like not get scurvy, uh, I think you could have a, a more limited mixture of foods. I just haven't done that analysis. Do, do you think it would be worth doing an experiment where you get someone to only eat mushrooms for a couple of months and see what happens? Uh, I think that would be very risky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we say in the book that you know if you ate a variety of alternate foods, but mm. something that might actually be a diet that we could produce if the sun were blocked and get permission from your doctor and take a multivitamin, then yeah, I think that would be good to know. And I, about the, the vitamins, you know, one way of getting sufficient vitamins is having a variety of foods. But of course, the people who are poorer would typically not get the variety of food, uh, which is what happens today. And so there are backup plans for vitamins like growing bacteria that would have a particular uh, abundance of, of vitamin or maybe even uh, synthesis. Uh, I haven't uh, analyzed that because I found that it would be feasible if you had a variety of food to get enough vitamins. How do you think people would react to having to eat such a large amount of kind of unpalatable food? Do you, do you think people would just accept it because the alternative is is death? I think most people would. Maybe not the foodies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, do you know how much, uh, what volume of mushrooms you would have to eat roughly to, to survive? I, I mean, because it, it seems like even, even many of these other foods that you're suggesting wouldn't be uh, as calorie dense as the foods that we normally eat. Well, in the case of mushrooms, uh, many of them are around 90% water. Hmm. And the, the, the easy calculation, at least for people in the US, is you need about a pound of dry food per day. So hmm. half a kilogram. And so if it were all mushrooms, there would be about five kilograms. But but other ones could be, you know, significantly less water, like if we were eating cow meat, for instance. Maybe let's just back up and uh, why why can't we use cows and sheep and, you know, other animals that, that eat these plants um, as, as, the main, as the main food source? The basic problem is that these large mammals only have about one offspring per year. And so they currently do make up a significant fraction of our total calories, something like 5% globally. But if it can only grow a relatively small percent per year, you just can't feed everyone on it. Right. Okay. So it, so it could stay at about 5% if we eat half of it. Yeah, I think I year. estimated up to 10% after five years. Okay. Okay. So it just, it just doesn't scale. Right. Okay. So that's, that's mushrooms. What's, what's the next uh, most promising option? Well, you, you mentioned insects. Uh, there have been quite a bit of interest lately in, in insects as human food. Of course, many people around the world have eaten them traditionally, but uh, not so much in, in Western cultures. And they've been promoted for uh, environmental reasons. They might convert uh, food more efficiently, uh, though if you're concerned about their welfare, that might be a, a problem. Mm. And there has been some work on feeding waste products to insects, but I haven't seen feeding you know, fiber, basically, like wood. And, and that's, that would be important in one of these scenarios. But there certainly are insects that, that can eat wood, like termites. Yeah. Could, could we live on termites? Uh, I think they're pretty tr nutritious. Again, well, a, an animal will typically have a lot of protein and 
uh, lipids or fats, but won't have the carbohydrate. And so there's potential if you just have that as your food source, then it might be like being on the Atkins diet where you're actually losing weight instead of gaining weight. So you need to have some, some carbohydrates, but well. lots of these other ones would have carbohydrates like the leaf extract and the mushrooms. Yeah. So, so how much mileage do you think we might be able to, to get from insects and, and rats and things like that, so setting aside any, any ethical issues? Well, the, the rats one is a little more complicated because they are not as good of a cellulose digester as some of the other animals we've talked about. Hmm. And so the cue I took is actually from nature where fish will eat partially decomposed leaves hmm. and fish cannot digest fiber. So why are they doing this? Well, they're, they're doing it to get at the bacteria that are growing on the leaves that the fish can digest. Oh. And so my thought is we might be able to do the same thing to partially decompose leaves and feed them to rats uh, or even chickens, which, which like humans have very little ability to digest cellulose. And how much mileage do you think we, may, we might be able to get out of, out of this category if we tried? Uh, well, I, I produce a graph of how fast we might be able to ramp up the different food sources. And some things could, could happen very fast, like extracting food from leaves. You don't have to wait for any organism to have offspring. Mushrooms can have a billion spores, so they can uh, grow very rapidly. The, the insects are somewhere uh, in between uh, the large mammals and, and the mushrooms, so they don't ramp quite as fast. Chickens are actually quite fast because they can lay an, uh, an egg a day, and rats are pretty fast too. So, th so there is some, uh, there is there is decent potential to, to scale there quickly if we're, if we're organized about it. Let's move on uh, to the two uh, things that I, I think we, we currently don't really eat that much, uh, which is um, growing bacteria with with methane and and breaking down plant matter with with, with enzymes and and bacteria. Let's maybe do the do the enzymatic sugar one first. Uh, how would that work, and and how much food could we get from that? Well, we can look at an existing cellulosic biofuel plant and basically interrupt the process at sugar. But what I'm interested in studying is there there are potentially some toxins in that. So the question is, could then we purify that that sugar such that people can eat it? But I mean, once you do that, we eat sugar now. So. It, it turns out that there are different types of sugar and some cannot be digested by people. And so we would feed that to animals. What does that look like? Do, do we have to have just lots of bioreactors breaking down, breaking down plant matter and, and then, I guess, processing it after that and feeding it to cows? Like, how, how complicated is this? Yeah, that's right. And it, right now, we don't have very many cellulosic biofuel plants. So the bigger question is, could we retrofit other chemical plants to, to do a similar thing? And, and that's one area I... I'd like to do to work with a chemical engineer to say, well, how feasible would it be to retrofit existing plants to do this? So if you're getting yeah this this broken down sugar coming out of these out of these plants and then we're feeding it to cows and sheep and so on, then then kind of we're back at square run because you can't you can't get those animals to to reproduce very quickly. But could, could you get other bacteria to digest it and then then eat that bacteria or something like that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, what, what what are the pros and cons of that? Depending on the bacteria, there can be issues with uh, human edibility, hmm. but there are certain types of bacteria that are fine for people to eat. And I use the example of spirulina, hmm. which is known as a superfood. People eat it as a supplement. It's actually in uh, in some health drinks that that look very green. So it's not it's not the same type of bacteria. It's actually cyanobacteria, it's photosynthesizing. And many people call it algae, but it technically is bacteria. So yeah, people, People can eat that, and and there are many examples of food that have a certain amount of bacteria in it, like yogurt. Okay, and and so you just think that this technology already exists? Do, do we need many many technical breakthroughs to to make this practical? There's certainly a lot of research on how to make this cellulosic biofuels competitive with existing gasoline, yeah. but it turns out gasoline is relatively inexpensive compared to most food we eat. And in a catastrophe, we'd be willing to pay much more for food. Hmm. So yeah, I think there is, there's a lot of potential for this to, to be cost effective in a catastrophe. Have you actually uh, eaten any of the alternative food substitutes that, that you're suggesting, especially the, the weird ones? Yeah, one example is the, the spirulina. Uh, it's very green and it does taste like spinach. Then I've also eaten a number of different insects, and there really isn't very much of a strong flavor, so you mainly get the, the spice that's been put on them. 
Okay, well, let's let's move on to the next one, which is uh, growing bacteria with methane, which is something that I uh, wouldn't wouldn't have guessed uh, was 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 a possible uh, food source. Is that technically hard hard to do, and and can we just then eat eat the bacteria that that manage to grow on methane? It is a pretty amazing thing that we have a life form that can not only use methane or natural gas as a food source, uh, as as an energy source, but also it uses the the carbon to build its its own bodies. Now you do have to add in some some nutrients like nitrogen uh, to make it work, but the basic process is relatively straightforward. And there are a few companies around the world that are looking into using stranded natural gas, which means too far away to, to sell into market, to produce the bacteria as fish food because it's high protein. Right. Okay. So is, is this already, already done anywhere? I believe it has been done. I'm not sure if it's commercially available. But yeah, they've, they've done it at a fairly large scale. They've put uh, tens of millions of dollars into demonstrating pilot plants. Do you know where we got these bacteria from? Are they kind of from hydrothermal vents or deep under the ground where, where you don't get access to, to food that comes from sunlight? I don't know the history, but yeah, they are called extremophiles mm. because they can live in an extreme environment to be able to use methane as a food source. How much methane or how much, how much natural gas would we need? And would it, be, would it be conceivable that in a disaster we could continue getting this much natural gas and, and spreading it around to, to um, everywhere that needs to produce food? It, it would be a lot of natural gas. With the current production of natural gas, I think we could feed about half of the people. But again, we'd probably only be producing 10% of our calories from this or less. Uh, so yeah, it could be a, a significant food source. And then as for the catastrophe, again, it comes back to the, you know, is in infrastructure still functioning? And, and then also I've looked at how fast we might be able to uh, scale it up. Uh, it takes a certain amount of energy to do your energy production infrastructure. Uh, but in the case of fossil fuels, it's a pretty small percent. So we could technically uh, ramp it up quite quickly. Yeah. I guess, again, because you're using bacteria, you, they, can, they can just replicate incredibly quickly. They, they, they'll have some pretty short doubling time. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not limited by the bacteria. Mm -hmm. What I was referring to is what's called embodied energy. Okay. So how much energy does it take to produce the drill that is drilling uh, for natural gas? I see. Um, so there's some physical limit for how fast you could ramp that up. Right. But it, as long as it's uh, only a few percent of the energy you produce, uh, you could actually double in, in less than a year. With all of these solutions that involve uh, bacteria... Do you have an issue with preventing uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria or, or viruses and in, in invading your vats and taking them over? Or I guess it's a sterility. Well, in the case of, of methane, I don't think too many random bacteria would be able to live in that environment. Mm, yeah. But in other cases like leaves and wood, uh, yes, you do have to worry about that. And, and what we do in the case of mushrooms, uh, we actually often grow them on, on manure and we first pasteurize the manure. And the cheap way of doing that is having a big pile of manure. And then first the bacteria start growing on it and increase the temperature a little bit. And then high temperature bacteria take over. So the low temperature bacteria actually die off. And then the high temperature bacteria keeps getting it higher and higher. And then it's only the low temperature bacteria that can actually live in humans or would be able uh -huh. to live uh, later on. And so you're basically killing off those competing bacteria and then you grow mushrooms on them and you need to, you know, keep it fairly well sealed so that you don't get recontamination. But, you know, it's a commercially mature process. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, do you have a problem with uh, mushrooms that humans can't eat also growing on, on the manure? Well, presumably they, they would be killed as well in that okay. pasteurization process. I see. Oh, because and, and then you only spread the spores of the mushroom species that you want. That's right. All right. So we've gone through, through a bunch of interesting ideas. Oh, yeah. One, one that I just remembered is... Uh, that, to, to my surprise, uh, in, a, in a nuclear winter scenario or in, or in a situation where the sun is largely blocked out, we would actually be able to get more fish probably than, than, than we could now. C can you explain that? Sure. The, the logic is that the vast majority of the oceans now are, are called an ecological desert, obviously not because of lack of water, but because of lack of nutrients. And if there were a, a massive sun blocking scenario, the earth would cool and the upper layer of the ocean would cool and sink and then deeper layers of the ocean would be brought to the surface which have more nutrients mm -hmm. and so we would have more nutrients available but we have the disadvantage of less light available and depending on the scenario uh, maybe more ultraviolet radiation so it, it needs more study but 
I, I did do a scenario because I thought it was, in a way, it would be more feasible than relocating plants uh, on, on Earth because you don't have the issue of different soil type and, and such. Uh, though I would say in, in recent work, I have been looking more into whether we'd be able to relocate plants on the I, ground. So, yeah, how much, how much would that increase the, the productivity of, of, of the oceans? Well, right now in the open ocean, the productivity is extremely low. Because of that low production, it's very low density of production of, of photosynthesis and the, the, the phytoplankton, uh, which is just small plants that are growing, basically. And then you, in order to concentrate that to produce fish, it has to go through many trophic levels. So you have the zooplankton that are eating the phytoplankton, and then you have, I don't know, I don't know, I, I've heard it can be up to seven different trophic levels. Mm. And so you start with low efficiency to start with, and then you go through all these trophic levels and you just produce hardly any fish. But in areas where there's active upwelling of the ocean, uh, the statistic I saw was 0.1% of the ocean area, so one thousandth of the total, produce 50% of the global fish catch. Because there you have abundant nutrients and you, you can have a very short uh, food chain. It can be fish that we can catch eating algae directly. So it's way more efficient. Right. Okay. So if, if the amount of um, uh, coasts that has this updrafting increased a couple of fold, then the productivity of the oceans could, could increase two or three fold. Yeah, it, it could be a, a really big increase. Now, there is the issue that once the climate starts cooling down, you'll stop getting that overturning. And eventually, you consume the nutrients near the surface, either because it's people pulling the nutrients out in the form of fish, though we might be able to put our waste back there, or material uh, falling out hmm. uh, into the deeper ocean. So that would be, it would only work for a certain amount of time, but then it may be possible to continue that by, if agriculture is not working on land, we're not using our fertilizers, we might actually just put the fertilizers into the ocean. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And would, wouldn't it be more efficient to, to eat kind of seaweed or, or algae directly rather than the fish that eat them? Because you, you don't lose the energy in the, in the conversion. Absolutely. Uh, but I have not been able to get the time to run that scenario. <laughs> but but yeah, potentially you could feed a lot more people that way. Okay. Do you want to kind of summarize the, the overall picture? We, we've, you've had all of these interesting ideas about, about how we might, might feed people that, that most of the others haven't investigated. Uh, collectively, uh, how optimistic are you that, that we'll be able to keep everyone alive? From a technical perspective, what we could do, I am quite optimistic because even though some of these solutions might not work out as well as I think they might. We do have quite a bit of uh, redundancy in the system. That is, when I analyzed the food sources individually, many of them could increase up to feeding everyone fairly quickly, like even in one year. Now, in reality, they would be competing for energy sources, so it's not quite as good. And I did write another paper which actually analyzed them, including the interactions, but still found that we could feed everyone over, you know, two times over or three times over. So that's what's technically possible. The, the other thing is that I've come up with another, and some people have, have given me more ideas based on uh, feedback, that there are other things that just haven't analyzed yet. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of those is seaweed, like you said, but other things like using energy from fossil fuels to directly synthesize food. We've already done that at the lab scale. So the question is, how fast could we ramp it up? I just haven't done that analysis yet. Or bacteria that run on electricity. You know, we've talked about how, you know, we have methane eating bacteria, but what about nuclear energy? Well, that's electricity. Well, maybe that could actually grow bacteria. And there are examples of electric bacteria. Hmm. And, and by the way, I would say one other solution that that is commonly proposed by people when, when we talk about this issue is, well, why don't you just grow plants indoors on your electricity? But it turns out it's extremely inefficient to take electricity and turn it into light and then do photosynthesis. So even if you have the most efficient algae, using all of our electricity would only feed, I believe, 5% of the people. So it's way, way better to use the natural gas directly on natural gas digesting bacteria. Yeah, where, where are we losing the, the energy there? The, the biggest loss is actually photosynthesis. Mm. So you produce the light and the typical crops in nature might be 0.3% efficient. Uh, if you're really good, maybe 1%. And then algae under ideal circumstances, maybe 3%. Okay, yeah, so photosynthesis just isn't, just isn't that effective. Right. 
This raises the issue. I imagine that almost none of our calories comes from any of these methods now. Basically, all of our food comes from the sun fairly directly. Would it be sensible to, to switch uh, our, our food supply now so that more of it is produced using these other methods, You know, even just because it might be cheaper or these would be just good ways of producing calories for people? Yeah, potentially. Uh, of course, you need to make it cheap to compete with current food. But I do think that thinking more about how we can utilize waste. Uh, I mentioned how cows used to eat corn stalks, uh, but now in developed countries, uh, agriculture has been disintegrated. That is, we keep our cows separate from our plants and we don't have that traditional integrated farm. So we could potentially either reintegrate or ship the corn stalks to to the cows Hmm. and, and reduce our environmental impact. And even if it's not cost-effective right now, people may pay a premium just to reduce their environmental impact. Uh, Another example is when we log forests. There's a huge amount of material, woody material, that's left over. It can be higher weight than the actual lumber we take out. But mushrooms can grow on that. I mean, why don't we get some food out of it? Do you think that setting aside any disasters, any of these methods would be applied just just to feed people for, for normal reasons within the next 50 or 100 years? I think potentially it just it all uh, depends on the economics. And as you pointed out, if we do have difficulty with conventional food because of, say, slow climate change, population growth, you know, many other problems like uh, loss of soil, soils getting salty, any of these things, they're not quite the big disasters that, that I'm working on, but they can add up. And if conventional food price increases enough, then, yeah, I think these other options could come in. And and the other possibility is local disasters. Generally, if you can just ship outside grain in, that's going to be the cheapest. But maybe transportation is cut off. And so you might want to know how to grind up your wheat leaves and get some more food out of them. Kind of surprises me that we haven't done this before. I guess it's just that food is currently just so abundant that we don't have to think very creatively about other ways of getting calories. Yeah, and even just in the last 50 years, the long-term trend has been reduction in uh, inflation-adjusted food price. Yeah. So it's it's not not thought about too much. So you wrote this book uh, where you discussed uh, all of those options back in 2014. Have you uh, changed your changed your opinion since then about which one of these are, are most promising and, and which ones you'd like to, to push the hardest? Well, I have done some initial estimates of how much they might cost. Of course, it's it's a complicated question for what they might cost in a catastrophe, but I've just said, well, how much do they cost now to give us some idea? And the lower cost ones included uh, the natural gas digesting bacteria, the sugar production with enzymes, and uh, leaf extract, potentially low cost fish. I I didn't mention that the the fish we'd probably be eating in a catastrophe are, are very small ones that could eat algae directly like sardines and that also breed very uh, frequently. But then another one, uh, as I alluded to, is the potential of relocating crops. And that's something I didn't uh, include in, uh, in the book. But I'm actually setting up an experiment now to simulate the conditions of nuclear winter in the tropics to see if plants can grow. And, and I think it is possible. Of course, there's uncertainty, you know, but I'm, I'm basing it on the, the simulation where about half of the sun is blocked and about an eight degree Celsius uh, reduction. And so we might be able to grow potatoes, for instance. How, how much food do you think we, we would be able to get in, uh, fr- from, from that? Well, that's what I'm, I'm going to try to estimate based on yeah. this experiment. But even if we can get a quarter of our food from that, then it makes it easier on, you know, to produce the, the, remainder, the remainder with these alternate foods. So it sounds like with, with a lot of these uh, solutions that, that you've suggested, there's, there isn't a lot of existing research. So you're having to, to guess quite often. And I think you're only really claiming in many of these cases to be right to kind of the nearest order of magnitude. So it could be kind of three times worse or, or three, times, three times more effective than, than what you're suggesting. What are kind of the, the pros and cons of having just, just such a, a rough view of all of this? I suppose it means you can cover a lot more ground more quickly but on the other hand, it's a bit difficult to compare oh, what should be your greatest priorities because uh, there's just not a lot to go on. Yeah, I think that uh, that's basically where you have to start. As you say, we don't have very much data to go by, uh, so there has to be a lot of estimation. And there are some things where uh, we can't say anything useful, uh, but other places we can. We have some idea, even though there's uncertainty in how fast we could ramp up different food sources, we can still say mushrooms will ramp a lot faster than cows will. And I would say also in the 
the cost effectiveness. In some cases, you just have to say, well, it's similar cost effectiveness to something else, but other things you can actually have reasonable confidence that it's more cost effective. Yeah. How do people react to this kind of first cut? Because I guess it seems very good to me that you've kind of done this. Uh, you've put the first brick in the wall here and you've said, well, here's the main questions that we need to answer within this field and, and no one else has really been working on it. But, but I know sometimes academics don't really like uh, doing things that they, they want to do kind of one thing very precisely rather than cover a lot of ground uh, vaguely. Have you, have you had a negative reaction to the fact that you're trying to do so much um, without you know, a, a lot of uh, existing literature to work with? It certainly has been a challenge uh, going through peer review. Uh, many people don't feel qualified to review it because it covers so many different fields. When I'm writing it, I always get experts to review, like hmm. a a mushroom expert or a rabbit expert, but you can't have a you can't have ten different reviewers on a paper, so it certainly has been a challenge. But you know, eventually we've gotten I don't know, something like seven peer-reviewed papers so far, uh, so it is possible. And generally, the way I I construct uncertainties uh, like a distribution is that wide enough such that most people will say, yeah, my value is in there somewhere, and then generally people are happy. Sometimes I've been criticized for having too wide of distributions, mm. but but I think you know that's certainly one of the lessons I've learned from the rationality community is that you should have really wide distributions, and and usually that's uh, you know people understand that that's appropriate. I'll just uh, add a add a note before we go into the next section that uh, regular listeners will will know that I'm vegetarian, and here we've been talking about eating animals. I guess I, we haven't considered the ethical issues here, here at all, although I imagine the ethical calculus would, would be a bit different if starvation was the alternative. Though it does also sound like animals in most cases is not going to be the most efficient way uh, to produce food, even in a disaster scenario. But I just wanted to, to, to bracket that so uh, <laughs> people don't hear me. So let's, let's move on to uh, envisaging kind of the, the world that this, that this would look like. I guess we can have a more concrete idea of actually to think through, you know, how useful would it be to try to prepare to do these things uh, sooner uh, ahead of time? So you said earlier that you thought only only some of the world's infrastructure would be destroyed and, and only only a, a small fraction of the world's population would be, would be dead in, in a nuclear war. Do, do you mind painting out in any more detail kind of what infrastructure you think would be destroyed and, and what would still remain? And you know how, how many people would be injured, say, in, in, in this disaster? So that we can, we can just try to visualize kind of what a city would look like in this case and, and what people would be doing day to day. Uh, again, there's uncertainty, and I did actually get into this uh, somewhat in the the paper that looked at nuclear winter uncertainty. That basically, if you have the really bad scenario, both from killing a lot of people and from the nuclear winter scenario of of targeting the population centers, uh, there would still be, depending on how far away you are from the bomb, there's a criterion of how much pressure of the blast wave is, like roughly what the percent of survival is uh, that we've gotten from the the Japan experience. Uh, but yes, you, you could have inj- injuries and then obviously any healthcare would be overwhelmed. So you'd basically be on your own. But the mortality would not be 100% even in the cities. Mm-hmm. And in the rural areas, yes, there would be radioactive contamination and, and, and increased cancer deaths, but it, it would not kill the majority of people in the rural areas. And the situation is even even less extreme in non-target countries. Though many people think, and there have been popular movies and such, that, oh, if we detonated this many nuclear weapons, then everyone in the whole world will die from radiation poisoning. Uh, But that's not actually the case because the the radioactivity generally rains out. Some of it right away, but most of it within a few days. And of course, some would travel up into the stratosphere that could stay for years. But at that point, if it's then only raining out over years, the the exposure is just much lower. So so that's why we've we've focused on what is the biggest problem, which is the food. Yeah, I guess I uh, I, I somewhat ended up with I think with a distorted picture of what um, a nuclear apocalypse would look like because I watched this movie Threads, um, which is fr- from the eighties, which uh, followed uh, a city in in Britain during an all out nuclear war between uh, NATO and and Russia. And in in that case, I think yeah, a very large fraction of the population was dead. Uh, and uh, most of the remainder uh, died um, in, in in the coming years of of starvation or cold or just or just their injuries. And basically, all of the infrastructure was was down, and basically the, the, the government fell apart. And I think that they were trying to be extremely accurate for what would happen in in Britain in this situation. But I guess that that is a worst case a worst case scenario because there'd be so many nuclear weapons at that time targeted at a very small country that's very densely populated. So that, so the radiation is much worse. And and the, the the number of cities that are targeted, the number of people who hit who hit directly with nuclear weapons, uh, would would be much worse. 
And so I guess, I guess you're saying that I should imagine places where basically, basically almost everything is still functioning, except perhaps there is a bit like an, an uptick in cancer and, and trade is to a significant extent uh, cut off. But, but otherwise, uh, things are still running. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends on how we react. And the, the basic assumption in the book of feeding everyone no matter what assumes that we continue to cooperate, which means uh, trade of goods, uh, sharing information, etc. But I, I have done some, some less optimistic scenarios, uh, say what might be an economic scenario. So you would still have trade. Uh, you would not have immigration, seeing as how much trouble we're having with uh, refugees at this point. That's probably not going to be a feasible solution uh, in a disaster. But if you still have trade of goods and sharing of information, and then a world food price, I was able to estimate, well, what percent of the, the population would survive? Hmm. And if you just have for, stored food, it's only around 10% of the population. I estimate even now, with, without any more research and development, if countries just knew about these solutions or were told in time before they resorted to further military action, we could do much better than stored food. Maybe 30% or so of people would survive. But if we actually got prepared, uh, like some of these alternate foods need more research, some have already been developed commercially, but we'd need to figure out how to scale it up quickly, say retrofitting factories. And we actually have plans for scale up and plans for how we would continue trading and things like that. Then survival could easily be 60, 70, 80%. So food's going to cost more if there isn't then, and this is no charity, right? But we could still have a much, much better scenario than just stored food. So we've mostly talked um, here about the, the nuclear apocalypse situation. And I think that makes sense because if we can deal with that, then that's that's the worst case. And, and we should be able to deal with most asteroids and super volcanoes and, and more modest wars. Is, is that right? That's right. That it, it is the worst case, uh, especially because it's longer lived. Hmm. The, the black smoke particles from burning of cities would be heated by the sun and actually lifted up higher so they would stay there longer. Whereas the supervolcanic eruption, the particles are whiter and uh, the sun might only be blocked for a couple years. Are there any other um, interesting aspects of, of, of the other catastrophe scenarios that, that we should pay attention to? Well, cer- certainly some of them don't involve blocking of the sun. Hmm. And then you, for instance, wouldn't have the overturning of the ocean. You could get a really large asteroid that could completely block the sun, in which case uh, we're not going to be growing any potatoes or, or any sea- seaweed. But generally, the solutions are applicable across a, a wide variety of catastrophes. So w- would the internet survive this? Because I was thinking of a very important aspect of the preparation would be that you have to share this information with uh, everyone around the world so that they know very quickly what, what they should be doing. But if, if the internet's down or it's yeah, much harder to communicate, then then that's something that you need to prepare for ahead of time. Yes, that is extremely important. But uh, fortunately, the internet was actually designed to survive a nuclear war. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Back in the 60s or so. So everything can just be rerouted through different different paths. That was the idea. Yeah. Huh. And so that, that was even trying to keep connectivity within the US. And of course, it's much easier uh, in the non-affected countries or non-target mm. countries. What about other issues like uh, people dying because it's really cold or they don't have access to water? H- have you considered that other, those or uh, is that just someone else's job? Uh, I, I did do a, a quick survey in the book of the different problems. My background is actually in energy, so I was interested mm. in that part of it. And so there's a question, can the buildings be heated adequately? There may be some circumstances where we can't do that and we need to relocate some people or people would do makeshift stoves and burn wood. So it seems to be not too hard. Now, the water issue is, is particularly interesting because if the earth cools, you get less evaporation from the ocean, and that ends up in less precipitation on the land, something like only half as much, which sounds really bad. But it turns out more than half of our water is actually used for growing food. Mm. So if we're not growing food, uh, we could use the water for, for other things. Okay, uh, so so I guess drinking water is the last thing that you would stop uh, using. So if if you if you right. cut back on showers, then you're not going to die of thirst. Yeah, and and it turns out the major uses of water are agriculture and cooling power plants. Uh, even showers is relatively small, and the actual drinking water is minuscule compared to those other things. 
All right. Uh, so um, that, I guess that, that is, that's a perverse benefit of most agriculture being gone. Yes. So uh, a critique that I've seen in, in some comments on, on your work is that in, in this scenario uh, with, with a nuclear winter or an asteroid, once that happens, kind of so many people's attention is going to be turned to how do we continue feeding ourselves? Because that's just going to be obviously a, a huge potential uh, threat to society. And given that you might then have, you know, hundreds of millions of people are thinking about this question after the fact, how much value do we really get from preparing, uh, you know, having, you know, a few dozen people prepare for it ahead of time? Yeah, it's a good question. There are some historical analogies. The siege of Leningrad, I believe, hmm. was a case where the city was cut off for years and many people just starved. I mean, you could argue now that we have better technology and better educated people, so we should have a better chance. Certainly, if we do have free flow of information, that makes it easier. They might find the work that all Fed has done so far just on the internet, or yeah, people could uh, invent it independently. So there's certainly that possibility. One concern I have is just that uh, leaders react quickly before the information gets out and, and choose the military route, um, and then you can easily have a downward spiral. The other thing is that, I mean, I do think that further dissemination of the research we've done so far would be beneficial, but we would certainly have a better chance of success if we did more work, like studying long-lived animals. You can't do that overnight. Uh, or, or figuring out what plants might actually grow in the tropics. Well, it takes a long time to grow plants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can do things in the greenhouse, but then we have to wait three months. So it would be hugely advantageous to actually have figured that out ahead of time and then have a plan so that we could start implementing it right away. Because every, every delay you have means, you know, fewer people are going to survive. Okay, so, so just the first one is that you think it's very important that people be made aware very quickly that it will be possible to feed everyone. And so they don't need to go out and fend for themselves. And, and we see kind of a, a, a breakdown of, of, of the legal system or of security. Right. Either within countries or between countries. Yeah. How, how confident are you that that's, a, that that's a big effect? That, for example, you, if we promoted this message that we would be able to persuade people of that and that it would make the difference between uh, the legal system continuing and, and kind of, uh, yeah, there being a breakdown of security? Not very confident. Um, and basically, we'll, we'll talk about later about the actual cost effectiveness modeling. But mm -hmm. there's, there's some probability that it will work out well based on our current preparation. If we prepare more, that probability increases. And you could certainly imagine spending trillions of dollars, like storing up food, and then we would be you know, extremely confident that it would work because we wouldn't have to have anything, any new technology work. We would just have the stored food. So I suppose it then becomes important to be able to persuade people that, that these technologies will work, which, which I guess is another reason why you want to be able to demonstrate them on a, on a smaller scale first. That's right. So that's one of our priorities now is to, to demonstrate technologies on a small scale. And it has a number of advantages. One, of course, doing a small scale experiment is less expensive. But then the other thing is that depending on the scenario, if we do have breakdown in cooperation, then we might not be cooperating well enough to retrofit factories. But if we could have something that grows food in people's basements, then that could still save more lives. And, hmm. and I've been focusing on saving lives, but the, the primary motivation for me is, is the long-term impact. And so I, I just think there's a very strong correlation between saving lives and actually retaining a functioning civilization. And you're saying that, I guess, the, the thing that can't be done after the fact very quickly is just many rounds of testing to figure out how to do this right. Right. Because you can't parallelize that. Even if you have 100 million people doing it, it takes you know, a month to test it out. And then you've got to go back to the drawing board and rework the prototype. Um, so, so that right. you have to do ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of uh, us being able to you know, keep the peace in a, in a disaster scenario, so long as the government tells people that uh, it, it has a plan for, for feeding everyone and so they, they need not turn to violence. Uh, do you think that people would believe the government if, if they said that? Is it kind of going to, going to be an issue of credibility that uh, people might think, well, of course they're saying that. They just like want to trick us into, into going along with them? Yeah, that, that was something that came out of uh, an EA Global San Francisco uh, workshop I did in 2016, where the, the general thought was that, of course, the government is going to say they have a plan, but unless they could credibly back that up with what they had done ahead of time, then many people would not believe them. So I think that's a, that's a good reason to, to do at least some planning ahead of time. Uh, another concern I have is that in the immediate response to the catastrophe, 
there may be lots of suggestions of, of ways of handling the catastrophe, and the the best ones technically might not win out, depending on the charisma of the advocates. One example we give is the, uh, the dependence on using all our fossil fuel energy or electricity to make artificial light and grow plants that way. And because that's an extremely inefficient way of producing food, we could use literally all our energy for that and not feed very many people. So the fact that we've tried to think ahead about how we could allocate resources efficiently, I think would help in the catastrophe time when not everyone uh, will probably be thinking rationally. So what what is all Fed's uh, plan? Yeah, well- yeah, if, if you had, uh, you know, a million dollars or $10 million or $100 million, uh, what, what kinds of levers would you be pushing? Well, I see it as a, a two-pronged strategy. One, as I've said, I think the greater awareness of what we've done so far would make it more likely that we have a good outcome. But of course, it's expensive to get message out. But we could be prepared to get it out very quickly. So One strategy would be to have a a panel of of experts, and this could actually apply to even beyond agricultural catastrophes, Mm. but have people trained in the media and and aware of of how to react, and then say to the media, well, we don't need a lot of your time now, but if some of this happens, you know, call us, and we'll actually have a message that's not just everything's going to hell and and panic, uh, which the media tends to like to say. And uh, similarly, maybe instead of the mass media, it could be on social media. It's very difficult to figure out what goes viral now. But if people are all of a sudden interested in feeding themselves, we could be prepared with a message that could potentially go viral at that time. And then a third way is to find influential people who it would be very advantageous for them to know ahead of time. And one example I give is the is Tim Benton, who was the uh, UK government food security champion. And even though he's not prime minister, that's his job of food security. So you would think he might be able to get the message in a catastrophe. Okay, so this kind of the, the advocacy and message spreading thing. Is there also... Like, like, I mean, how much infrastructure should we build ahead of time? Should we have, you know, appropriate mushroom spores spread out all over the place so that we can very quickly start start growing them? Yeah. So, so I guess I should say on the, the, the information sharing, why that's the first prong is one of these catastrophes could happen this year. Hmm. And so I think we should spend some of our efforts to say, what would we do if, if that happened? But of course, then we should further develop the, the technologies to have a, a better message to spread uh, if the catastrophe happened later. And as for the the preparation beyond the research development and planning, there are many solutions that that we could do that would cost a lot of money uh, other than food storage. Uh, We could ahead of time retrofit plants or, you know, build new plants, chemical plants, so that they could be very easily switched. That would be great, but it might cost billions of dollars. So I wouldn't do it first. So basically, there's a, a big supply curve, basically, of, of risk mitigation. And what I want to identify is the ones that could give us the biggest bang for the buck. That's what we should do first. So is, is Allfed doing uh, very much media at the moment in order to kind of spread, spread the word about, about how, how we could feed everyone in a disaster so that people will stay more, stay more calm after the fact? We, we have done some of that, uh, though we have been updating recently based on uh, EA feedback on the potential downsides for uh, mass media outreach now. So our thought more now is to be ready for a catastrophe, that is, have relationships with journalists so that they would contact us in a catastrophe and then hopefully we would get this more positive cooperative measure uh, information out uh, rather than the typical doom and gloom in a catastrophe. I guess, do, do you need to build up any, any experience with, with media? I suppose you're doing that now to some extent. So we, we have had some experience with, with interviewing, uh, though we do want to do more, more training. And, and ideally that we work with other organizations uh, so that they could react well in a catastrophe. And it doesn't have to be necessarily just agricultural catastrophes. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, doing an experiment to figure out how much uh, food you could grow in the, in, in the tropics in a nuclear winter scenario. Uh, are there any other experiments or, or trials that you're thinking of running? Yeah, lots of them. So uh, I've talked about the methane digesting bacteria being done at, at commercial scale. It's potentially possible even at household scale, uh, assuming natural gas still flows. Uh, so I'd like to, to try that out, see how efficient it might be. 
And it's also been suggested that uh, UK listeners might be familiar with corn uh, with a Q, which is a fungus-based uh, protein source, uh, mm. often as a, as a meat substitute. And that is grown more like industrial, like in vats. So that might be a cheaper way of converting cellulose into food than, than growing mushrooms. So that would be great to investigate small and, and large scale. Yeah, that, that makes me think. Uh, it sounded like some of the options you're considering could have commercial applications today. And uh, potentially, even if it's not you know, exactly what you would do to prepare for a disaster, if you could build a business that figures out a way that to, to grow mushrooms on, on wood uh, in a way that's profitable now, then, then it could be uh, at a much larger scale should one of these um, disasters happen. You wouldn't need donations because you could fund it just by selling the product. Yes, and, and we're certainly open to that. Uh, and I've heard one critic say, well, but then if it becomes mainstream, then you don't have the ability to, to ramp it up quickly. But that would only be if it were you know, very large. So uh, still, I think it would be a benefit to, to commercially develop more of these technologies. Sorry, I, I don't understand that. If, let's say that we were getting 50% of our food through corn, hypothetically, this, this vat-grown mushroom stuff. Then, then doesn't that just mean that um, we're not so dependent on, on sunlight anymore? even if we can't scale it up that much more. Yeah, I guess that is true. Uh, you still need to have a supply of the, the energy source. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, if it's, if it's using wood, then we would have lots of wood. Okay, so let's switch now to talking about the cost-effectiveness analysis that uh, you've recently got published. And actually, uh, it looks like you've got, got two different papers published. Uh, one, cost-effectiveness for interventions for alternative food to address uh, global catastrophes globally. And then another one doing, I guess, a similar, similar analysis just for the, for the United States. Um, do you want to describe how you did that cost-effectiveness analysis and, and, and what you found? Sure. So in the case of the United States... The, it gets back to what I talked about before, the modeling nuclear winter, because really that's the only catastrophe that could cause starvation in the United States. There, of course, could be other bad consequences, even if there's not starvation in the United States, like a refugee crisis or, or conflict abroad that spreads. But the easiest to model is starvation in the U.S. And for that, the cost effectiveness turns out to be very large, even though it's only just from one country selfishly to prepare for these alternate foods. And it's partly because the alternatives for saving American lives are extremely expensive, like healthcare or environmental regulation or, or traffic safety. Hmm. But what is probably more interesting uh, to your listeners is looking at the global case. And for that, uh, I actually did the 10% shortfalls that we've been talking about, because those can start cause mass starvation globally, as I said, not because there is technically not enough food, but because of price increases and the poor of the world not being able to afford it. And as I said, there's tremendous uncertainty in what our response will be. The mortality could be as low as millions, or it could even be billions if it goes very poorly. But the, the expected value was in, in the hundreds of millions if one of these catastrophes happened. And in this case, uh, we're comparing to actual uh, give well estimates of saving lives with uh, mosquito bed nets. And that, the, the cost to save a life is in the thousands of dollars. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, my analysis indicated it was more like tens of cents to hundreds of dollars uh, to save an expected life. And this is not assuming the catastrophe will definitely happen. This takes into account some probability that the catastrophe will not happen. And actually only looks out a couple decades because mm -hmm. Things could change dramatically for people in a, a, a general audience. Their, you know, research we do now could get out of date, or planning we do now could get out of date. Uh, if you're worried about risk for artificial intelligence, then something much more dramatic could could occur, and then these things would no longer be relevant. So, do you want to uh, kind of map out what what the key parameters were? And and uh, one thing that I really like about the cost effectiveness analysis that you've done is that. Uh, you've put it into this kind of internet tool called Guestimate, where you map out ranges or probability distributions for all of the different parameters that, that, that are feeding into the into the ultimate life saved per dollar figure, um, which makes it a lot easier to to kind of scrutinize and figure out where where you agree or disagree. But maybe yeah, what what are kind of the key numbers that you had to estimate to to figure out how many lives you might save per dollar? Well, in this case, the, these papers were actually written before uh, Guestimate existed, so I was using the the software Analytica. But ah. it's it's still possible that. Uh, you can you can view it for free and, and modify assumptions um, if you're interested in doing that. Yeah, we'll stick up a link uh, to that. Yeah, but there are a number of, of assumptions that go into this. We've already talked about uh, some of them, but there's 
some other important variables are, in this case, we're talking about saving lives, so the probability of feeding everyone if we don't do anything more versus if we do these interventions. And I actually broke out three different, or actually four different interventions. One was this planning. One was more research, especially on the technologies that are have not been researched very much. One was on development, to actually commercially develop the more promising technologies. Those all cost something around $100 million. I also consider a more expensive option, which is training. And so here you can easily spend billions of dollars mm. uh, because it involves lots of people and it's actually, you know, maybe even periodically or every year or something running running drills and you know obviously the military is very good at this so then they know exactly they are fully trained they know how to respond that would provide more value it would increase the probability of success but it would cost billions of dollars mm. and so it's not the first thing i would do so then you put all this together in a uh, monte carlo model which a probabilistic model to give you uh, outputs and and they are, as we said, they vary orders of magnitude. But in the case of cost per life saved, even though the variation was four orders of magnitude, it still really didn't overlap with the estimates of saving lives with mosquito bed nets. So you can actually say with, with some confidence, if you believe in the inputs, uh, that this would be better. Um, so, so the high end uh, in, in this paper, it looks like it was uh, $400 per, per life saved, which I guess... Uh, you're saying compares pretty favorably to the to the few thousand dollars that Givor thinks it takes to save a life with with bed nets. That's right. That's for the the three relatively inexpensive interventions. So so in this paper, you're estimating just a, a very low cost per per life saved. Do you want to kind of justify? Is, is there any way of kind of intuitively justifying that to to a listener who might be skeptical that that that's plausible? Yeah, I would say that I think that there are clear things that we can do to increase the uh, probability of feeding everyone. I think we would, as we said, be much better prepared with a plan and with more research and development. And then, you know, of course, you have to believe there's a significant chance of one of these catastrophes happening, uh, which I think there is reasonable evidence for. But then the big picture is just that no one has worked on it before. And so, you know, you could say that unintentionally people have developed this methane digesting bacteria, which is great for us that it's already been commercially developed, but they haven't thought about how it would be done in a disaster. So we can just be much better off if we actually think that through. And then there are other things that just haven't been researched. And so I think we're just at the very early stage where we can be highly cost effective. We can uh, pick that low hanging fruit. All right. So in addition to that paper, you've also done an analysis where you looked at you know, how likely this is to make a difference to uh, kind of the long term future of humanity and, and, and lowering ex- existential risk. Do, do you want to kind of talk about what, what's different about that model? What, what, what gets added? Sure. So we still have probability of a catastrophe happening. And so we're using that probability of, of nuclear war for, for one part of the model, for the, the sun blocking catastrophes. But now here, we're not asking how many people would die, but we're asking what is the impact on the far future. And my initial work actually on an EA forum post was considering one way of impacting the far future. And that was a collapse of civilization and then not recovering that civilization. And so by some definitions, you would say, oh, that's not an existential risk because people have not gone extinct. But if you actually look back at Nick Bostrom's original paper, there are several different types of existential risk. And he defines existential risk as something that prevents humanity from achieving its potential. And so if we lose civilization and we continue on Earth as hunter-gatherers with a few million population, you know, maybe we would go extinct because of the next asteroid. But even if we didn't, we certainly are not uh, achieving humanity's potential. And so that does qualify by that definition as one existential risk. Then after that work, partly based on uh, on feedback on it, and also based on my reading of uh, 80,000 hours work, I shifted to a different perspective, which is, well, there are many routes how these catastrophes could reduce our long-term potential. It doesn't have to be just losing civilization and not recovering. So one example is this catastrophe, if it goes poorly, many people die, lots of conflict, that could be a a scar on the the human psyche, and we could become nastier than we are now. And I would say that would make 
it more likely that we uh, that that nastiness gets put into artificial intelligence that we develop that they may, that then may uh, determine our long term future. And I think there are several other possible routes to having a long term impact from these catastrophes. So, so kind of there's there's two different flows of value here. Uh, one is uh, thinking about just like lives saved in a more in a more normal sense, and then you're thinking about you know what's the likelihood of it reducing a an existential catastrophe which could put humanity on a worse trajectory such that you know we never manage to achieve our full potential, what, what, whatever that is. Right. There's two different kind of cost effectiveness analyses that you could do, and I suppose there's also two different scenarios. There's the like you know all out sun is sun is massively blocked case, and then also thinking about the ten uh, percent uh, reduction in agriculture scenario. Like which uh, which out of, out of those two, which one is generating the, the most value in, in this analysis? Perhaps surprisingly, they are similar. Uh, and of course, I say similar because that means the very large uncertainties are overlapping <laughs> each other. So the, the 10% shortfalls are more likely to happen. But of course, if they do happen, would be less likely to have a far future impact. And so for this particular work, uh, implemented on, on guesstimate, uh, which is uh, developed by an EA, and it's great that it's very easy, uh, like basically spreadsheet based, uh, that you can modify the assumptions if you disagree with them. Mm. But what I tried to do instead of just coming up with the distributions myself, I thought I would survey other existential risk researchers to try to get estimates of you know what what is the the far future impact likely to happen with current preparation and how much would spending $100 million actually improve the outcome, both for the sun blocking scenarios and the the 10% shortfalls. So it seemed to me uh, looking over this guesstimate sheet, I admit I, I wasn't able to, to fully understand it. It's, it's pretty scrutable from Monte Carlo, uh, <laughs> for Monte Carlo simulation, but it, uh, it does does take some th- some thinking through. Um, and, and I definitely encourage people to go and take a look at it because it's uh, it's it's uh, fascinating. And, and I think that it's a it's an approach to, to modeling that, that should be used uh, much, much more. It seemed like so, so. There was kind of four key numbers that you needed to estimate. One is the likelihood of of a big for, uh, food shortfall. Then there's kind of the likelihood that that flows on and, and wrecks the long term future. And then there's the likelihood that kind of the preparations that that all Fed might do would make the difference between it being you know really bad for long term future versus you know we recover from it and things go okay. And then I suppose you had to estimate how much that would cost. And if you kind of multiply the, those three, that divide by the cost, then that gives you an idea of the of the benefit to cost ratio. Is 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 that kind of right? That's right. So let, maybe let's go through each of these in turn. So it looks like uh, you you estimated or you had like a, a median case of a 1.9 risk of a, of a full scale nuclear war uh, each each year. Uh, where did you get that number from? Because it, it seems quite a bit higher than than figures I've heard from from other sources. Right. So I sh- I should clarify that in guesstimate the the single value that is reported is the mean, not the median. Oh, okay. And this is uh, a huge difference in the case of very large distributions. Hmm. But but the background is that uh, two of my colleagues uh, at the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute, Seth Baum and Tony Barrett, looked back at the close calls for for nuclear war and uh on this podcast you've you've gone into some of those and many of them are are very scary how close it, we might have come to nuclear war hmm. and they built a what's called a fault tree analysis where you have to go through a certain number of steps for it to actually turn into nuclear war and so then they were able to actually put a quantitative estimate on nuclear war and it's very large range. The 95% confidence interval is something like 0.01% to 10% per year. But because of that large range, partly, the, the mean turns out to be around uh, 1% or 2%. And that, that does sound very high. That, that is higher than, than most people's estimates. And from one perspective, you should say that maybe we should update based on the fact that we have not had a nuclear war in the last 72 years. Hmm. However, you could say we have had a nuclear war in the last 73 years. Now, of course, the circumstance in World War II was different than now. But if you were to say that, then the annual probability would be about 1.4%, which is in the ballpark. Now, because it's not the same, I do think we should be doing some updating downward uh, based on the evidence. However, this model actually only considered inadvertent nuclear war, which means one side thinks they're being attacked and therefore, quotes, retaliates. And then the expectation is that there would be an actual retaliation afterwards. But there are other scenarios that could lead to full-scale nuclear war, such as an actual intentional attack. Uh, 
or there could be an accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon that could be misinterpreted and, and, and escalate. So from that perspective, you could actually argue the probability should be even higher. Yeah. Okay. So I think I still think that this number is too high. So uh, what are some of the reasons? I guess it doesn't seem uh, right to say that we had kind of one, uh, like and it's true that nuclear weapons have been used once in a, in a war in the last 73 years, but the situation was so different that, you know, just to use over a single city and the risk of, uh, you know, and all that, of, of that precipitating and all that nuclear war were, 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 so, were so, well, I mean, obviously it couldn't happen because they were the only ones with nuclear weapons. That doesn't really seem like it's in the same reference class because everyone knows that if they, if they use the nuclear weapons now, it would kind of be, be the end of their, be the end of their country in, in effect. And and that, and that wasn't the case when it was used uh, against against Japan in World War II. So if you if you do the calculation where you say you had a 1.8% chance of a nuclear war per year, then over 70 years, there should be uh, a 72% chance uh, of an all-out nuclear war uh, over that period. So it seems like we get like a pretty big update uh, against against that having been the probability at least at least in the past, right? And and in addition that 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 paper with Seth Baum where, where they did that that fault analysis, it's got so the ninety percent confidence interval is between I guess point zero three three percent per year and sixteen uh, percent per year, which is I mean it's because that's over like three or four orders of magnitude. It seems like they're basically saying that they just have have no idea. And then just to take kind of the mean of people giving this such a wide range, yeah, it just it just seems like a lot of a lot of weight to put on something that's basically saying we have no clue. What do you think? What do you think of those ideas? Well, I think that. It's good that it's actually quantitative uh, mm. because so much of people's guesses are, are not based on an actual quantitative model. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, would, I would trust it more because of that reason. But I, I would also say that we can't just multiply the, the probabilities using the mean mm. uh, because there's uh, – and actually I do this at the bottom of the, the guesstimate model. Uh, the, if, if this were true, the 1.8% per year – What's the probability remaining in the 21st century? And if you use the means, it's it's very high. Uh, when you actually multiply out the distributions, which is what the accurate way of doing it, then you get 38% chance. Okay, so, so but it's still high. Yeah. Okay. So what does that come to in a if you just had to pick one number? Then I guess that's like 0.5% chance a year, 0.6% chance a year. Yeah, around there. Okay. So that's so that's less far off the uh, the estimates people give. I guess. I think Anders Sandberg wrote a paper where he said it was like closer to 0.1%. Maybe that seems a bit on the low side because we have model uncertainty. Yeah, I think he was saying that the 0.1% was the median and the mean was closer to 1%. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so it would be fairly close. Be fairly but close. but yeah, you could, cer- you could certainly argue that it should be half as much or okay. a third as much as this. And it turns out that the conclusions don't change very much. Hmm. I suppose it's also true that you haven't considered any scenarios other than the nuclear war, although that that probably is the is the biggest one. It it does dominate the asteroid and the supervolcano. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What if you if you had to critique this number and say it was a lot lower? Uh, what what kind of argument would you make? Well, I, I would say the arguments you have made uh, <laughs> to basically how much should we update based on the evidence? Yeah. Uh, and if if the evidence is no war in the last seventy two years, then there's a pretty strong update. Yeah. I guess. Uh, I think Anders also uh, claimed in in my podcast with him that the fact that we've had so many near misses and haven't had use of nuclear weapons uh, could actually point the in the other direction that that this final step from you know a false alarm to actually using nuclear weapons is in fact extremely implausible because otherwise we wouldn't have as many we wouldn't be able to see as many near misses because we'd kind of be dead if there was a near miss. Have you have you heard that line of line of reasoning? I I did I did listen to that that good podcast <laughs> and that was an interesting point. But I mean the I think the counterpoint is we could have also been lucky. Yeah, so you just have to have to weigh those up. I got to admit I, I I did find that a bit counterintuitive. So uh, maybe maybe uh, you and Anders should talk and. Um, and see, yeah. see how much you should update that number. I, I suppose another uh, argument for it being lower is maybe just that people find this implausible on its face. So they kind of have this outside view or that they kind of do a common sense check and say, yeah, I just don't think that the risk of a nuclear war each century is 38%, in which case I guess they should adjust it lower. But but I suppose you're saying even if you, you know, halve it or third it or quarter it, it's still going to look pretty cost effective. Yeah. And I mean, you could also, talking about the outside view, think of the Fermi paradox that mm. many people have explained the Fermi paradox as in most civil Organizations destroy themselves with nuclear weapons or, or something else. Or something but, similar. But, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the, to, to the next key figure, which is, I guess, uh, the likelihood that uh, a nuclear war kind of wrecks the long-term future of humanity. What was your estimate for that? And, and would you like to, to, to justify it? 
so this one, unlike being based on a quantitative model, mm. it was based on a survey of existential risk researchers. Unfortunately, only a sample size of seven, <laughs> uh, but I figure it's better than just me uh, coming up with the numbers. Yeah. And uh, so there, interestingly, my number was pretty consistently close to the median that there were people much more pessimistic and much more optimistic than I was. But when you when you run the mean, the number we're getting is around a 17% reduction in far future potential because of full-scale nuclear war, uh, which is actually in the ballpark of, uh, of what was on uh, your analysis at 80,000 hours. So, so there people are envisaging that there's a risk that it might, through like a cascading series of bad luck, cause us to actually go extinct. Or that, yeah, we, we could just become morally uh, worse because of, because of this disaster and less able to cooperate with one another. Are, are there any other key considerations that you had to think about when you were coming up with your estimate for that? Well, certainly the losing civilization and not recovering, um, even if you don't go extinct. Like technological civilization falls apart and then we don't become kind of advanced again. Right. And, and I should say that there are different ways that people define civilization. Hmm. I would say most people use it in terms of uh, technological civilization, so a loss of industrial civilization. And that's more likely to happen, but not as bad. I actually focus on what's called, uh, what I call anthropological civilization, because it's the way anthropologists define it. And that is basically cooperation outside your local clan. So they say the first civilizations was when we actually developed cities and uh, you know, larger scale cooperation. And that scenario is less likely to lose that civilization, but would be much worse because then you might be reduced to just a few million population like we were before we developed that civilization. Yeah. So so given that it seems like even in, in an all that nuclear war where we didn't have very good food alternatives, there's a good chance that, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of people would survive, maybe, maybe even more than that. Why Why wouldn't we recover? I personally am fairly optimistic that we would recover. There's been some talk about why we might not recover. For instance, uh, we don't have the easily accessible fossil fuels anymore. Hmm. A guy named Louis Dartnell, who wrote the book The Knowledge, is about if we lost civilization, how could we recover it? And uh, I think it's it's a great book. I'd recommend it. He also wrote an article saying, well, how might it work if we don't have fossil fuels? And I think there, there are still roots of recovering it, but it would be more challenging. Uh, another one is potentially something that, that wiped out the, the grass family, like we talked about earlier, because so many civilizations have been built on, on the grass family, uh, mm. corn or wheat. Now, the exception is, is potatoes, uh, like in South America. Then you could say, well, maybe the trauma of the catastrophe would select for people who are nastier or not trusting so maybe we wouldn't develop that trust of people who are not related to us. Mm. I don't know how, how high probability that is, but it's, I think, at least possible. Maybe the disaster somehow permanently affects our, our IQ or, or some other characteristic mm. uh, that, that made uh, development of civilization not possible. I think uh, uh, Eliza Yudkowsky said something like, we are the least intelligent that it is possible to to develop industrial civilization, as in we we just were able to cross the threshold, because it's it's interesting that it took us something like a hundred thousand years from anatomically modern humans to develop from where we are now. If we had just had the knowledge we have now, we could have grown at three percent population growth per year, and it would only take a few centuries. But it took us a hundred thousand years. So, you know, I, like I say, I'm optimistic that we would recover, but it's just, I think, not a... Not a sure thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there's, there's other considerations, like it would probably take hundreds of years to recover from something like this to, to where we are now. Or well, maybe not, maybe a hundred years. And in that time, we would know how to make nuclear weapons or how to, how to make like weapons that are much worse than what people had historically. And plus, yeah, would, there would have been selection for people who are, who are more violent and able to survive in a, in a difficult world. So um, maybe we just actually can't go that long without a serious war. And it's going to take a long time to, to rebuild. So it's kind of a conflict where we never, we never quite managed to, to, to get to a really good state again. Yeah. And I think Nick Bostrom also considered that scenario of kind of bouncing up and down and, and never achieving, he might have called it technological maturity or something like that. 
So seventeen uh, percent chance of uh, yeah, either I guess through extinction or like loss of loss of values that would generate values in the future doesn't doesn't seem too far off, especially given that we're so uncertain about it. It doesn't seem like we should choose a number that's really close to zero or really close to one. So the next one then is the likelihood of preparations by all Fed um, kind of making the difference uh, compared to to what we're doing now if if you don't exist. What was your estimate of of that, and and what was the reasoning behind it? So first, it's how much progress we have made so far relative to what would have happened without any work. So I mentioned how you know, people could just find on the internet the, the work we've done so far, and that could help out. So of course, we need to do the analysis at the margin, like how much benefit do you actually get from spending more money on it? So that's the baseline. And that number came out to be 4%. So that's 4% reduction in the loss in the far future, if that makes sense. From what you've done already. Yeah. So okay. so we're not subtracting 4% off of 17%. We're multiplying that 17% loss by 0.96, 1 minus 0.04. Yeah. Okay. And so then, uh, as we've said, if we could spend $100 million and do this research and development, planning, scale-up, et cetera, uh, a plan for the scale-up, that is, then the estimate came out to a mean of 18% additional reduction in the loss of the far future from a catastrophe. So it so goes from fifth. 17, so you've gone from 17 to like 16.5% uh, so far, and then uh, you're hoping to push it down to more like 15 or 14%. Right. Yeah, okay. And, and what, was the, what was the reasoning behind those numbers? Well, again, this is based on a survey, but uh, it's actually compared to the, the paper uh, that I wrote about probability of feeding everyone, it was actually, in that paper, it was greater percent improvements. Mm. And it's an interesting question to say, well, what's what's easier, saving civilization or feeding everyone? And I would say it's probably easier to save civilization. So so if anything, if you believe the paper, this number could be higher. What was, I mean, do, do you know what, what people's justification was to, for giving this answer in the survey? I, I tried to limit how much work they had to do. <laughs> okay, so yeah. uh, it was kind of just voluntary if they wanted to, to yeah. explain it. Okay, so thinking that you've uh, reduced the risk of civilizational collapse in a disaster scenario by, by four point something percent, it seems like quite a lot, just given kind of what a like that is, we're talking about only a small number of people, um, and you know the world is very big. You, you don't worry that this is a bit too optimistic, or like we're, we're thinking too much about like what what we're doing relative to the to the billions and billions of people who haven't heard about this this book or, or any of these studies. Yeah, I, I think my estimates of of what might have been achieved so far were more like a, a 1% uh, improvement mm. that I think it is valuable to to have done this initial research, but some of the things might not work. Even if people know about it, they might not try it. I mean, they might mm. do something else. Uh, so there are definitely many failure modes at this point. Yeah. Or I guess people might have done this analysis after the fact, as, as we talked about. And the, the, yeah, I guess it seems like the, the, the key things that people can't do afterwards, like these experiments that have long lag times, haven't been done yet. Right. Okay. Well, let's move on to talking about the, the last figure, which is the, the cost of the preparations. How did you estimate that? And uh, how, how reliable do you think it is? Well, seeing as I'm a professor, I, I do think about how much it costs to fund a grad student and, and do an experiment and, and write it up. And so I was thinking, well, how many how many grad student years does it take to do some some research on these key promising ideas? And you'd be doing research on quite a few ideas, and then you would only invest the money on developing the ideas that are more promising. And then I, I tried to talk to the the people who are growing the natural gas digesting bacteria and found that they spent something like $10 million actually commercializing it. And so I said, well, yeah, we'd probably want to commercialize a few more of the promising technologies. And then on the planning side, I, I thought about, you know, on the low end, it would be like briefing a few key people and, and writing report. But in reality, you then need to make sure it's current. Uh, mm -hmm. So update the plan. And when people change power, then you need to brief a new person but still, you know, you could do that in, in quite a few countries for not that many millions of dollars. And so there, the, the range was between uh, something like $30 million to, to $200 million. That was kind of the, uh, the range of plausible uh, things that you were doing for, the, for this, yeah, for envisaging this, this amount of preparation. Yes. 
So then what is the ultimate cost effectiveness that comes out of this uh, out of this guesstimate sheet? Well, then we have the whole separate section on the, the 10% shortfalls, mm. but similar logic, higher probability, lower impact. Uh, it turns out a lot of the preparations would be relevant for both of them, so similar costs. But then what you end up with is, you could say, a dollar per reduction in the long-term potential, which is not a very intuitive number because it's, it's very tiny. So in order to make it make sense, you need to compare it to something else. And so for that, I, I used the Oxford Prioritization Project, where they developed a model and also fused in a model that was uh, developed by Owen Cotton Barrett and Daniel Dewey, and doing the same basic thing uh, on guesstimate, what's the probability of something bad happening and the cost. And, and, and one, one key difference was they were looking at the marginal cost effectiveness uh, of just $1. So in order to compare this to the cost effectiveness with alternate foods, we actually have to convert uh, my analysis of spending $100 million into a marginal analysis. Mm. And so there are two numbers you could use. One is the marginal analysis of the last 100 millionth dollar, and that's going to be less cost effective than the average. But if you say the marginal cost effectiveness right now, then that is going to be higher cost effectiveness than the average. And so basically, I've developed a, a comparison with, with all of these numbers. Yeah. And what you would like to know is what's the ratio of cost effectiveness? But it turns out that when you deal with numbers that are very uncertain, you get very unintuitive results. Hmm. Like alternate foods is 20 times as cost effective uh, than, than AI, but AI is twice as cost effective as alternate foods, <laughs> um, which doesn't make sense. But when you multiply it out, you know, the, re the reciprocals, you actually get one, <laughs> which is really bizarre. Right. Um, but because that's so non-intuitive, I had shifted, and that's what I did on the original EA forum post, I instead shifted to the perspective of what's the probability that one is more cost effective than another. So if that is 50%, then you would say, well, they're about equal. Now, in reality, if there's a different spread, then you could still say the expected cost effectiveness of one is higher than the other, even if it's 50% probability of being more cost effective, hmm. if that makes sense. And one of the surprising things was that the, the uncertainty in this model was actually greater for alternate foods than for AI. And I thought it was going to be the reverse. And some people responded, well, yeah, I would probably have made the AI uncertainty greater. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't put too much stock into that. But basically, the, the result was, depending on what marginal analysis, you know, which dollar you're talking about, it was between 93% confident that it's more cost effective than AI to 60% more confident that it's more cost effective than AI. And so, you know, again, if you want to change numbers, that number is going to change. But because the uncertainties are so large, you can actually change the number by a factor of 10 and the, the confidence doesn't change that much. And so even if you're skeptical on, uh, on quite a few of the numbers, I think what's robust is they have similar cost effectiveness. And, and I would say that to people who are very convinced of the high cost effectiveness of AI, of AI and might be skeptical of that conclusion, I would say that overall AI, I do believe, has greater importance. I think it has a greater probability of affecting the far future. However, alternate foods are significantly more neglected and probably more tractable. Okay, so so the logic is yeah, even even though um, AI seems like it's kind of more likely to be the thing that the that the that the future turns on. There's dozens, maybe hundreds of people you could say working on that, whereas you think there's only a couple of people working on alternative foods. So an extra person can make a bigger contribution on the margin. That's right. So I'm imagining uh, that some listeners are looking at this, uh, and if they looked at the spreadsheet and saw just just how wide the confidence uh, intervals are on this might think that this is a bit of a, uh, this is kind of what, what, what people might imagine that effective actors do is that we kind of plug in these numbers and then spit out numbers that are extremely uncertain and then just go uh, with, with, with the middle case, even, even though it's so uncertain that in a sense, maybe we just haven't learned that much at all. And give well and, and open fill, I think when, when they're so uncertain or when, when the cost effectiveness estimates are, are so uncertain, they tend to use other uh, ways to decide uh, what to fund, like kind of common sense heuristics, like how sensible does this seem? Like what, what do experts think? You know, do we believe that this project is well run? 
Yeah. Do, do you think that, uh, you, I mean, do, do you agree with that approach that when we can't really say how cost effective something is uh, because because we don't know the inputs, that we should adopt uh, or at least give a lot of weight to, to, to other decision making procedures? Well, I would say that if you are honest about your uncertainty and you actually propagate that uncertainty throughout, then like in the case of the, the, uh, the present generation, I do think that we should have some confidence that alternate foods is more cost effective than than the give well interventions because the distributions are really not overlapping. In the case of alternate foods versus AI, then they really are overlapping. So you, you can't say with very much confidence. But I would I would still say that it's valuable to to run these models about neglectedness and scope and mm. tractability. I mean, I, I think it's great that 80,000 hours have actually put numbers on that. I still think that the next step is to say, it's not just scope, neglectedness, and tractability, we can actually try to put real numbers on this mm. and you know, say, what would we do? How much would it cost? What is, what is the impact? And I, even with the uncertainty, I still think we're getting closer to a realistic estimate. So if, you, if you're taking a Bayesian approach, then you kind of start with your prior beliefs about you know, how plausible this project seems, and then you, then you update based on the cost-effectiveness analysis. And in as much as the cost effectiveness analysis is very uncertain. Maybe the update isn't that much. So you give a lot of weight to like what you thought already. So it might matter a lot whether someone wants to fund this, but you know, whether at first blush, it seemed like, seemed like a sensible project to them in the first place. Yeah. So I have not explicitly done Bayesian updates. I would say that where the updates can be really extreme is when you're comparing across causes. So the idea of how much do we value the far future? Well, that is just huge, huge uncertainty. Yeah. And so it's very, very difficult to compare the mosquito bed nets and AI in, in the same metric. And so if you have a strong prior, then you say, oh, look at all this uncertainty in AI, I'm going to have an extreme update. But the advantage of this analysis is that we're saying the far future is the same value. So we don't have that huge uncertainty. So that cancels and, out. Right. And so I, I would argue that, that we don't have that, we shouldn't have that extreme potentially extreme update. Hmm. Now, still, we could say, let's look at how cost-effective analyses have fared in the past. Hmm. And it is generally true that they get worse over time. Uh, we get reversion to the mean. And that could apply to AI. You could argue that it applies even more strongly to alternate foods because it's newer. Though I would say that in terms of cost-effectiveness analyses, it's actually not much newer than, than AI. I, I didn't really see much quantitative until the last couple of years. But still, there are many few people working on it, and and you could argue that reversion to the mean would occur more strongly in the case of alternate foods. Uh, well, what's the argument that it's that it's more tractable? I mean, they, they both seem like engineering problems where probably there's a solution, but it's it's not fully not fully explored yet. Not to criticize AI, but yeah. I, I think many people who do criticize AI say, well, we don't know what the artificial intelligence is going to be like. I mean, mm. we can start studying the artificial intelligence that we know now, but it could be completely different when we actually develop artificial general intelligence. And, you know, I think Owen Cotton Barrett has gone through some of the pros and cons of working now versus later. And I think that's a significant con of, of working now, that things could really change a lot. Whereas in the case of alternative foods, we do really understand <laughs> what we need what we need to do. Yeah. And so I, I do think that some amount of money should be spent on AI now that we can make progress and we can get uh, talented minds to, to bear on the problem. But if I had $3 billion to spend on far future risk mitigation, I would actually be spending right now uh, potentially more on alternate foods hmm. because we know what to do and the catastrophe could easily happen this year, which... You know, generally people don't think that's possible for artificial intelligence. So I, I do think there's great urgency. And, and some people have even argued that that should be a, a fourth category, a, in addition to scope, neglectedness, and, and tractability uh, of urgency. Yeah, it's kind of how much can we delay this? Yeah. And, yeah. and then I would say still, because AI is more important overall, I would still spend the majority of my budget on AI. Hmm. Uh, but I would spend a lot on alternative foods now. So you mentioned like a potential fourth criteria for choosing what problems to work on is is uh, urgency. Um, do, do you have any idea of like how to how to quantify that that kind of thing and, and include it in the framework as a whole? Yeah. So in the the framework of some of the earlier papers that looked at saving lives, when you try to put a value on a life, which of course is controversial, but uh, used large 
uncertainties, then you can think about what the return on investment would be or the payback time of putting this money into alternate foods. And it turned out that the payback time was was very short, both in the, the global case and the U.S. case. And it, particularly in the U.S., uh, the return on investment was between 800% and 40 million percent per year. So even if you only believe the lower bound, uh, it's still a really high return on investment. And so one way to think about it, this is, well, it's very, it's very urgent. So we should be capturing these opportunities that pay off very quickly first um, and then move to, to other things. How do you get the kind of 40 million percent? Is that like what happens if there's a nuclear war next year <laughs> or something like that? So technically, uh, I, I work with this, this idea of payback that if we complete the research and then reduce the risk, then just looking at the probability of nuclear war, which has uncertainty in it, then it's saying that you would pay back that investment very qu- quickly. So just in terms of expected value. But in, in the case of the U.S. particular one, the cost per life saved, I think, went down to something like $1 per life, whereas what we spend now in the U.S. is millions of dollars per life. So it just it pays back very quickly if you're, if you're saving lives at such a low cost. And, and related to this is, is kind of a speculative idea, uh, which I did mention on the, the EA forum post recently, of is it possible, if we can't convince governments to do the preparedness themselves, is it possible to fund that, say, for instance, with, with EAs, uh, with some agreement saying that this would then save governments a tremendous amount of money to save their citizens, because at least the, the richer countries would generally be able to save their citizens lives, but at great cost because the food would cost so much if there were not alternate foods. And then if there were a catastrophe and if it saved the government billions or even trillions of dollars, then some of that savings could come back to the EAs and then the EAs would be able to then put this money uh, towards whatever the most cost effective cause is at that point. So I don't know if this would work, but... Seems like it would be hard to get them to, to, to make that deal or stick to it. Yes. And so in terms of making the deal, at least it's more attractive to the government than funding it themselves. But in terms of follow through, you could say, well, it's still no regrets from the EA perspective, because even if they don't follow through, they've, they've still saved all the lives. It's just they wouldn't have quite as much impact as if the government actually paid out. Yeah. I guess it's another way of demonstrating the, the rapid uh, kind of return on investment that you get in principle even if you never actually managed to manage to collect the money. Right, right. And that's related to the urgency that then if we think there are other problems that could use a lot of money at a later time, say AI, uh, then we could have a win-win by funding both. Uh, so so is it the case that uh, these alternative uh, foods look pretty cost-effective to work on uh, even if you're only concerned with, with the present generation and not with kind of the, the, the very long term? Yes, and, and that's where I've done these cost-effectiveness calculations for saving lives, and that is focused on the present generation. And so I think that even though there has been the most interest among EAs in the the long-term future implications, I think that it does have potential to appeal to those EAs most focused on the present generation. And of course, most of the interventions uh, for that cause area have had much uh, more certainty. Uh, I would say there are some exceptions to that, like the uh, recent discussion of uh, deworming on the eighty thousand hours podcast. Uh, you you mean the episode with uh, with David uh, David Rudman, who's worked at Give Oil and Open Fill. That's right. And there could be other examples, like funding research for vaccines, is a uh, more uncertain than than your typical global poverty intervention. Okay, so I guess another heuristic that you could use, uh, other than cost effectiveness analysis, is to uh, look at kind of what what do relevant experts think. Like the people who know a lot about fungi think that yeah we could we could feed people uh, with, with fungi and this is something worth worth funding. Have you managed to you know uh, check your work with uh, other academics and, and what what has the feedback been like? Well, as I mentioned when I was writing the book, I tried to get at least one expert to to review the different sections. I do have a fairly interdisciplinary uh, education, so that I feel like I can talk to the experts. But uh, it's certainly great to actually get their review. The experts have generally been saying, well, I haven't thought about that question, but yeah, uh, that seems plausible. And then we would need to do some more work to, to actually make it more detailed. Have you spoken to any security people or, you know, or people who work on food security specifically? 
Uh, yeah, I, I've been to uh, like the the conference. Um, it's like basically an international conference on global food security, and uh, talked to people there. For instance, the the head of the International Food Policy Research Institute in uh, Washington D.C. and it was interesting talking about with him, as as I mentioned, when talking to people outside of EA, we generally focus more on on the ten percent shortfalls because it's more imaginable. Mm. Uh, some of the bigger ones sound more like science fiction. And he was fairly optimistic that we would be able to handle a ten percent shortfall. And I said, well, what if it were twenty percent? What if it were thirty percent? And then he was like, oh yeah, you know, we'd be in trouble and we'd need to do something else. Uh, also, have talked to uh, Professor Swaminathan who led the Green Revolution in uh, India and was actually uh, rated by Time magazine as one of the 20 most influential Asians in the 20th century. And uh, I met him at that same conference. And actually, we had one of uh, the Alfed uh, team members go to his institute in India. And, and he, was, he was quite positive on it. Uh, we did some, some interviews with him and saying how he basically was front line in increasing agricultural productivity to to stave off a, a kind of slow term disaster of uh, of overpopulation. But he, he definitely saw the the merit of looking at these. Uh, what would we do in the the abrupt changes? So yeah, obviously it looks incredibly cost effective uh, on on paper. I guess what what are kind of what what are the doubts that you have? Uh, what, what what keeps you awake at night? Um, in that potentially you've you've made a mistake here. Is, is there anything that that worries you? I certainly am aware of the opportunity cost uh, within EA, mm. uh, that if money goes to alternate foods, then it's not going to something else. I do think, though, that if you look at the marginal dollar now, I think there's a fair amount of confidence that, yeah, this is, this is worthwhile. And one advantage is by spending money now, we can get value of information. We can see, oh, is, is this turning out to be promising or not? And then we can decide later whether we want to spend additional millions of dollars. And the answer might be no. Yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot of learning potential. Is, yeah. is, it, is it possible to raise money from uh, somewhere where you think otherwise the, the money just won't go to a very effective project? So we certainly are uh, targeting uh, outside of EA. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing as I'm a professor, you mm -hmm. have to apply for, for research grants. We've been looking at uh, National Science Foundation, where they're focusing on hazards. I've looked at uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy. W one interesting uh, proposal is, uh, I mentioned the connection with biofuels. Well, one way of justifying a biofuel plant now is that, that the risk is that oil prices go down and your plant doesn't make any money anymore. Mm -hmm. But if you could switch the biofuel plant to producing sugar that people could eat, mm. then that makes the plant more economically resilient. And so that actually is one, maybe the most promising thing that we could justify economically now. Uh, so yeah, I am pursuing funding for that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Are there any other kind of more economics or policy-based solutions to this? Like, uh, for example, I think the, go the government uh, sometimes pays uh, reserve electricity producers uh, to just kind of sit around waiting for there to be you know, the risk of blackouts or some disturbance in the electrical grid that they can then come in and, and, and keep, things, uh, keep things running. Is there any way that we could incentivize people to uh, provide food in a disaster, even if they're not providing it now? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. In fact, we ran a catastrophe planning scenario event in um, Gothenburg, Sweden, as kind of an add-on to an existential risk conference. And one of the participants, who's now a, a board member, uh, Robin Hansen, who you've had on the show, did suggest that, in, in that we don't want to just make plans and not know if they're really going to work. So maybe we could have a system such that the government says, so get ready, and then at a random time, we're going to say, press go, and you get paid based on how much food you produce two months from, from that time. <laughs> and, and then that can test, well, can we really switch over the, the production uh, mm. to producing food? So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, that's really interesting. I guess it's a bit, bit expensive or hard to get through Congress at the moment, but uh, maybe one day, or, or perhaps, in, perhaps in some country that, that takes resilience uh, really seriously. And it's expensive if, if we're talking about producing a lot of food, like mm. a, a whole plant. Uh, like a chemical factory. But if we could do this on a smaller scale, then it might not be so expensive. So have like any, you know, other academics or, or insurance companies maybe or governments tried to uh, kind of do estimates of the likelihood of these um, agricultural shortfall scenarios? Yes. One example is the Lloyds of London 
uh, study that looked at uh, 10% agricultural shocks. And they did not do probabilities, though the UK government uh, study did do probabilities. But neither of those looked at, at alternate foods as a potential solution. And we've also talked with organizations like the World Food Program, and they are generally saying, well, we're just trying to deal with catastrophes like that have happened in the past decade, like a 1% global food shortfall that happened in 2011. So it's been hard to uh, get them to imagine the, the bigger catastrophes. And that's where EAs have been much more receptive to, to thinking about these type of catastrophes. So what, what kind of journals does this kind of stuff end up getting published in anyway? Well, we've been published in a few different areas. There are some journals on disasters. They focus on less catastrophic disasters. There have been some journals on uh, food. There's uh, futures. And I think it is important to, to publish in mainstream journals to get uh, other people exposed to the ideas. Uh, but I also think that we've had, uh, say, three special issues on existential risk recently in the last four years, and I think they've turned out quite well. So I think there is potential to actually have a specific uh, existential risk journal. Do you think that would be hard to hard to get off the ground? I think that it could start with just one or two special is- or one or two issues a year, and I think there would be enough material for that, and then you could see see what happens. So some people have said that it's kind of uh, good for us to think that uh, nuclear winter will be extremely bad for humanity because it makes uh, people much more reluctant to, to ever use uh, nuclear weapons and to, to put even more effort into making sure that, that there's never is an accidental nuclear war or un- unintended nuclear war. Is, is it possible that by like making the prospect of nuclear winter seem much less bad by inventing all these um, alternative foods that in fact you're like you're unfortunately increasing the risk of, of nuclear war because people would become more, more complacent about the issue? It's possible. I would say that for the countries directly involved, certainly the nuclear exchange would be uh, terrible. And the alternate foods does not mitigate those direct impacts of blast and, and fire. And so I highly doubt that the decision to go to nuclear war in the heat of the moment would be influenced by whether there's a backup plan. Now, there is evidence that both Gorbachev and, and Reagan cited the nuclear winter studies as a reason to reduce nu- nuclear stockpiles in the 80s. And it is true, we've reduced nuclear stockpiles by about a factor of three um, in the last few decades. Now, some critics have said it was more a decision of uh, reduced cost in the case of the USSR, uh, that they were becoming bankrupt. So there's some uncertainty how much the concern of nuclear winter actually led to uh, disarmament or reduced arsenals. Uh, so I think there is some possibility that alternate foods, if implemented and actually believed there was a backup plan, that that could be an excuse to say not reduce nuclear arsenals as much as they would have otherwise. Uh, but I think it's it's fairly low chance. And I think overall, we would be in much better position with a backup plan. But I will point out that in this uh, guesstimate model for the impact on the far future, I do have a parameter for moral hazard. And so you can you can adjust that if you want to play with the model. Yeah. How does one estimate a parameter like, like that? Like how, how large the, the moral hazard issue is going to be? Seems very hard. It is. Uh, given my energy efficiency background, I use the analogy that there's this concept called the, uh, the take-back effect, where if people install more efficient uh, light bulbs, then maybe they leave their lights on more more frequently. And so there have been studies that have shown that you calculate how much energy savings you should get, and then you might only get 80% of that in the actual implementation. And so that that's one way to think about it, not necessarily directly analogous. I suppose you can maybe also think of it as like an, as an economist, I think perhaps more as an elasticity. So it's like if you make nuclear war half as bad, then like, you know, the probability of it goes up 20%, or like the willingness to engage in it goes up, uh, goes up some amount. Uh, I guess it's like very hard to know what, what that elasticity actually is. Uh, I, suppose, I suppose a bad case would be where if you like halve the badness of it, then the willingness to go to war like it more than doubles. Uh, that, that seems fairly unlikely given that I suppose most of the people involved uh, would expect to, expect to die uh, in that scenario regardless because they're going to be directly in the firing line. Right. I, I do think that is a useful framework, the elasticity pr- framework. But yes, to actually have it end up worse off overall, I think is very unlikely.
how did you end up deciding to work on alternative foods rather than, say, your nuclear non-proliferation or, or trying to, to, to reduce stockpiles? And do you think that those those projects are potentially like similarly effective or, or more so for, for someone who has you know the right fit to work on them? Well, I have actually published a paper on, on reducing nuclear stockpiles because I have this model for the impact of, of nuclear weapons. And, and we argued that just from a selfish perspective, that countries shouldn't have more than 100 or so nukes because uh, even if they were fired on another country and if there were no retaliation, you still have this environmental blowback. So yeah, I certainly support efforts to reduce nuclear stockpiles. I do think in terms of my own uh, priorities, alternate foods is just so much more neglected uh, that it's a, it's a higher impact opportunity at this point. So the thing that people talk about most of the time when they're thinking of a, you know, a all out nuclear war is uh, the US versus versus Russia. Is there like a risk of, of, of other conflicts, of, for example, between like China and, and, and Russia and China and the US, given that China is uh, modernizing its military, and I, I think it will probably expand its, its nuclear arsenal at, at, at some point. And, and how, like, how bad would those scenarios be? It, it certainly could be very bad if uh, China expands its nuclear arsenal. But what I've realized recently is even if it doesn't, if it stays with its uh, couple hundred uh, nuclear weapons, if there were an exchange between uh, US and China or Russia and China, because China now has uh, developed so much and urbanized so much, the thousands of nuclear weapons coming from Russia or the US could produce a tremendous amount of smoke uh, entering the stratosphere. And then the several hundred nuclear weapons from China would hit potentially the biggest targets in, in the, those other countries, causing more smoke. And so I think there is potential in that type of exchange to to block the sun. And uh, as, as you've mentioned on a, a, a recent podcast, looking at when there's been a big transition in uh, who is the most military powerful country in the world, uh, that past experience indicates that might be a 9 in 13 probability of happening. Now, of course, we can't take it literally, but I think it is concerning that, that a scenario like this could potentially block the sun. And, and also a reason why the estimates of probability of blocking the sun, uh, though, as you've argued, might be too high in the case of just U.S.-Russia, this could be a reason why they, they are actually reasonable. Yeah. So, so like, part of your argument was that, that there's a, an especially large amount of combustible material in Chinese cities just because the population is enormous and they're very concentrated? Well, it's that it has changed rapidly in the last few decades because of the development of China. So you can have a lot of people, but if they're in rural areas and they don't have very big houses, even in the urban areas, then there's not that much combustible material. But now if you just look at the total size of the economy of China, at least from a purchasing power parity perspective, it's actually larger than the U.S. So that's an indication that the combustible material in China might be comparable to the U.S. now. So people often said, well, I'm not so worried about China because their nuclear arsenal uh, is quite small. I think it's like 300 weapons or something, which is uh, on, right. on, the, on the lower end. They've been like fairly responsible. But I suppose that you know, if if, the, if Russia or the U.S. went to war with China, then it like matters how many that Russia and the U.S. has, and that if they if they do an all-out strike on uh, China, then you could end up with a lot of firestorms and a lot of material potentially going going into the upper star, upper atmosphere. Right. Uh, so some of the some of the figures that you give for like how cheap it might be to save a life, you know, it's like uh, you know dollars or at least like you know under under a hundred dollars uh, per life might might strike people as as, as kind of amazing, uh, especially if we're talking about you know saving lives in in the, in the present generation, not not even considering the, the long term future. And I wonder, like, how much should we have kind of a, a prior or, you know, a, a preconception that just the probability of being able to save lives that cheaply uh, should be very low. So we should be skeptical of like of any model or, you know, any organization that, that claims to be to be able to do that. And I'm thinking here, there's this kind of a lot of people have this sort of principle that uh, it, it would be like a surprising situation to find yourself in where one person can affect like a vast number of, of, of other people and, and, and save them at, at, at very low cost. It, it kind of unless you have something where like everyone has to act uh, or simultaneously in order to save one another. It can't be the case that kind of most people are in a situation where they can have a very outsized effects on, on, other, on other agents because just there's always going to be kind of more people on the receiving end than the, than, than the saving end. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I guess if I tried to think about my prior before doing this work, I would probably have very large uncertainty bounds. And 
I guess why I would consider the possibility that one person could have a really big impact might be related to the fact that I think there's a probability that I could invent something that's uh, that's really important. Um, and maybe that's that's being too confident, but it is true that some people do invent something that's really important and, and have a big impact. So even though I would say this analysis ends up with quite a bit of uncertainty, I think it's a lot less uncertainty than I would have had going into it, that I would have had even larger bounds. And so, so still, I would update based on my super large uncertainty, based on these numbers, towards those numbers. Yes, yeah, this, this question of like what prior should we have against being able to have a huge impact is kind of interesting and probably should get a section on, a, on, a, on another episode. I guess it, it kind of can't be a, a, a definitive argument against uh, thinking that you can have a large impact because we know that there are some individuals in the past who have managed to have really large impacts, yeah, through like scientific research they've managed to save, you know, potentially tens of millions of lives or through like catastrophic political outcomes that managed to uh, cause the deaths of tens of millions of people. Uh, and if you were like so skeptical about that ever ever being possible, then probably you would simply like doubt your own eyes and say that this is this, this could never happen, that it would be impossible for Mao to kill that many people because it, uh, it's more likely that you're hallucinating or something like that. Uh, rather than that had actually happened, if if you kind of if you kind of took this like extremely skeptical view that it's not it's uh, very very unlikely for one person to affect such a large number of others, but yeah, there's a, there's a kind of lot of lot of thorny uh, like questions about how to what, what kind of prior you should have and how you should update uh, that that probably we should go into more detail in some other episode. Uh, so one thing that occurs to me is that. I'm not an expert on this, but I think I recall that in various like past disasters, various societies have lost, you know, 10 percent of the population or more. So I think in, in, in World War Two, the Soviet Union lost about 15 percent of its population. And that society kind of yeah basically continued afterwards, although it was like a horribly scarring experience. And I think in some in some pandemics in kind of the Middle Ages, it was uh common for you know, 10, 20, 30% of the population, at least in, in a region to die. And those societies did kind of carry on. So it m- makes me wonder, like, perhaps we're a bit more resilient to, you know, the, those kinds of population losses that we might get in a nuclear war or, or, or in a global food shortfall. I think it is good to look at historical examples. Uh, one thing that, that could make this a little different, if we're talking about a 10% global uh, food shortfall, perhaps causing 10% of people globally to die, then locally that's going to be more than 10%. And then, of course, some places it's going to be less extreme. But I think what I'm, I'm most concerned about with these uh, 10% scenarios is the spiraling downward is the way I describe it. Like tensions are high and then maybe there could be further conflict, even leading to a full-scale nuclear war. Yeah, another thing that uh, that, a, that a listener wrote in to, to ask about was um, that in, in Robok's model of a kind of full-scale nuclear war, uh, Robok being one of these exp- experts in nuclear winter, it seems like uh, most of the Southern Hemisphere, yeah, most of the Southern Hemisphere would have like much less severe uh, temperature declines, I guess, because less of the particulate matter is making it down there, which would potentially allow for kind of ordinary agriculture to, to, to persist in Australia and New Zealand and Chile and things like that. Which I guess the Southern Hemisphere is not not super populated compared to the Northern Hemisphere, but it suggests that we might expect you know tens or hundreds of millions of people to survive uh, potentially fairly easily, uh, regardless. Uh, which which potentially like narrows the scenarios in which kind of uh, all fed prevents like yeah a, a, a major collapse of civilization. Well, I think the the temperature falls were less extreme generally in the tropics, though they do expect the smoke to spread globally, so that. There, there would be significant losses of temperature in the southern hemisphere. Uh, but the other thing is that larger continents being farther away from the ocean, they're going to have greater temperature drops. So, so yeah, it certainly would be less severe in certain areas. Now, I think it does depend on the, the details of how the scenario plays out. If there's not enough food for everyone and people can move towards where there is food, uh, that is, if it's not protected, then still p- potentially everyone could could starve. So people have talked about, well, are islands more isolated? But uh, assuming that we still have most of industry functioning and, and have large ships, there, there could be basically people trying to get to those islands and, and get that last bit of food. I see. So you're thinking that uh, people could kind of like uh, invade New Zealand to some extent if New Zealand's doing particularly well? Potentially, yeah. Hmm. That's, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I still kind of feel that like it's there's potentially quite a, a narrow range of scenarios in which Allfed makes the difference between you know a permanent collapse uh, versus not because the scenario in which Allfed makes the biggest difference is one where 
so many people have died that kind of humanity is at risk of not recovering or, uh, you know, having further conflict that just puts us on a, on a downward spiral. Uh, but on the other hand, you need the damage to be not so great that like the preparations that all fed has engaged in kind of the information that it's disseminated or the experts that it has or whatever else are not like, are not blown away and just, or, or just made redundant by, by later efforts that the people engage in at the time. So yeah, do you think this is kind of a factor that, that, that reduces the, the cost effectiveness of the approach, at least, even if it's not, not decisive? Well, I think to clarify, what, what you're getting at is the, the long-term future implication, like the losing civilization. I, I think even in these smaller catastrophes, if alternate foods could reduce the food price, we can reduce the number of uh, fatalities so that we could save lives in those scenarios. But in, in terms of the, the losing civilization, I mean, there are people on the pessimistic end that are worried about if we run out of oil or have another financial crisis or two degrees Celsius slow global warming, you hear people talk talking about this is going to put us back into the Stone Age, you know, this is going to destroy civilization. I, I think that's too pessimistic. But as I said, once you start getting into the, the 10% food shortfalls, I think the, the major worry about losing civilization is not the direct impact, but what, what happens afterwards. But then on the, on the extreme end, I would say even if you get full-scale nuclear war and devastation of infrastructure in target countries, still you have most... Uh, industry functioning globally. And even if the sun is blocked, fossil fuels are not dependent on the sun. And so I think that there definitely is opportunity to save civilization by providing a lot more food. And then the other thing about, well, would this happen anyway? Uh, Would people realize, well, we need to have food sources that are not dependent on sunlight? I'm very concerned, as I said, about the immediate reaction and if it is a scenario, people realizing that most people are not going to survive, then that's uh, a terrible scenario to be in and, and could result in further conflict and chaos, whether it's within countries or between countries. So I think that if people were aware ahead of time or we could get the message out very quickly in a catastrophe and people realized that if we cooperated, we could actually feed everyone, then we're, we're more likely to do it. Of course, it's not guaranteed. I guess the case for all fed kind of rests on this this vision of like what society will look like afterwards and, and i guess the, the risk that conflict could then be the thing that really like knocks us off at the second stage and that's what we want to prevent do you think it's worth kind of engaging in further study to try to like clarify what would the world look like and how would people be behaving in that scenario or maybe it's just so hard to know what like a post nuclear you know uh, war world would look like that um, you know, thinking about it more is just not going to really clarify things and it's just always going to remain opaque and we kind of have to prepare maybe for the worst I think it's going to be hard to say anything definitive, but I think that one of the projects we're interested in doing is estimating what each country might be able to do on its own um, in terms of having food storage that is not prepared, any more preparations, or with alternate foods, how much food could they produce. Generally, people are, if they feel like in their country, they are self-sufficient in food, they would be more willing to trade. Whereas if they feel they're not self-sufficient, then they might ban trade, which would be a, a bad outcome overall. And so I think there there are things that we could say usefully uh, with some more analysis. And so one of the projects is, is doing using geographic information systems, GIS, to kind of map out what the resources are and then potentially uh, look at possible scenarios. With different levels of, of severity. Yeah, so you've mentioned that that to some extent, uh, all Fed has been has been limited by the amount of money that it uh, that it has access to. So, um, how much how much money are you looking to raise at the moment, and uh, what do you think like any extra donations or unexpected donations that you get uh, would would be would be put towards? Yeah, we have uh, fairly detailed plans of using around uh, 1.5 million dollars over the next 12 months, and this may sound very large because we have not used nearly that much money so far, but it's because we've developed alliances with uh, other academics that are experts in particular areas like mushrooms, rabbits, chickens, cellulosic biofuels, etc. And so we have basically set up such that if we had the funding, then we could do these projects. And it would also involve uh, recruiting uh, undergraduate and graduate students largely at uh, uh, Michigan Tech and uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks, where I am. And so some of the things that we, we would like to do 
Uh, we've actually just started grinding up tree leaves and extracting food from them and uh, using some fancy equipment to analyze the toxicity. So we'd like to do many more leaves to figure out which ones are the most promising. As we develop this uh, natural gas digesting bacteria solution for the house- household scale, we would like to actually produce a, a practical kit and have how-to videos of, of people you know, instructing people how to, to use it. We'd also like to do plant growth experiments simulating uh, nuclear winter scenarios. So this is an, a, a good example of something we'd want to know ahead of time because in a catastrophe, we don't have time to experiment with lots of plants over many months to let them mature. So we'd want to figure that out ahead of time and then know where to plant uh, specific plants. So this is a scenario where we still have some sunlight. So we're talking about uh, the tropics where it, it likely would not freeze. We also want to investigate uh, financial mechanisms for for funding the work. Uh, for instance, through insurance or catastrophe bonds. We have a person on the team, uh, Sahil uh, Shaw, who's who's looking into that. Uh, I mentioned the GIS to map out alternate food resources and analyze uh, cooperation scenarios from economic, political science perspectives. Uh, we'd also want to do experiments on turning uh, cellulose, so leaves and such, into edible sugar. And I've mentioned how that's already being turned into sugar, but that's not human edible at this point. So we would need to do some experiments to figure out the processes to actually make it human edible. And then we would be ready to say, how fast could we retrofit existing industrial facilities? Or if that turns out to be too difficult, perhaps fast construction of new facilities. Yeah, are there any other other doubts that uh, donors uh, donors raise and that you'd li- like to respond to here preemptively? Well, certainly a, a common one, uh, especially outside of EA, is this idea that if you put a lot of effort into mitigating a catastrophe that never occurs, then you know would the effort be wasted? And I use the example of you may pay for insurance that you never use, and you, we don't consider that wasted uh, because we're insuring something that we can't afford. And and I think of this work as an insurance policy for the earth. Yeah. So uh, how can how can listeners donate if they'd like to, or I guess potentially uh, you know have an email uh, or like phone call with you to like yeah clarify any other questions that they have. Yeah, it's easy to donate on our website, uh, allfed.info. And yeah, I'd be happy to, to have one-on-one conversations with interested people. Yeah, I guess your, your, um, your email is on the website there as well. Yes. Are, are you hiring and uh, what, kind of, what kind of staff do you need? If, if there's, yeah, what, what, what sort of listeners would you like to potentially apply to work at AllFed? So yes, we, we do plan on hiring. Uh, of course, how much depends on how much uh, money we get. But I think that there's the, the AllFed proper where we're doing more of the, the awareness and, and media work. And then... There's the the actual research that might be based at a university. Uh, as you mentioned, um, I'm based at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And then the, the original co-author on the book, uh, Professor Joshua Pierce, is at Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan, also in the U.S. And he has done a lot of uh, experimental work with, with 3D printers. He does a lot of uh, appropriate technology for, for less developed countries. And so we would we would hope to be uh, building up teams of, of undergrads and, and grad students to to advance the research. Yeah. in what kinds of fields? A, a lot of engineering, of course, mm. uh, you know, chemical engineering. We talked about chemical plants, mechanical engineering, building systems like we talked about, making sure buildings can can handle growing mushrooms and, and the cold and such. But really, a, a lot of fields. I mean, economics is extremely important for estimating the the cost of these. And you know, for for some of the the low level studies of how much does this engineering equipment cost, that's more engineering economy. Hmm. But uh, economists tend to be, you know, more more bigger picture. But hmm. I think there there is important bigger picture. Uh, implications here, like what are the prices of things going to be? Well, you can't just assume their current prices. E- even if you know food is going to be more expensive, well, maybe the inputs, maybe electricity is going to be more expensive. So it would be great to have uh, an economist that knows how to do uh, general equilibrium models, such that we could get a, a better handle of what how the whole system would respond. How about uh, like food scientists or a- agricultural people? Absolutely. Yeah. 
so, so you'd be interested in potentially taking them on as PhD students or as postdocs to, to work on like, yeah, ver- some of these various different options? Uh, right. Or, or funding them in their, their home institutions, if mm. that's more effective. Uh, are there and, any other roles that you're looking to fill? Yeah. So we're also interested in, in volunteers. We've benefited greatly so far from, from volunteer time. And we've put uh, several dozen uh, effective uh, theses on the site Effective Thesis, which, by the way, I think is, a, is an excellent idea to better utilize uh, people's thesis time. Mm. And, you know, other volunteers could, could support with, uh, with media, admin, etc. Uh, there's also a, a, a maker component, this, this movement of people making stuff themselves. We hope that we can do research and say, well, is it feasible to grow natural gas digesting bacteria in your house and then maybe develop instructions? But then we want to know if it actually can be done by the average person or at least not uh, an engineering grad student. And so then it would be great to put these instructions out and have people try it out, see if it works. What about uh, operations people just to help scale the organization? Yes. Now, we have been very fortunate uh, among the EA community to have a great director of operations, Mm -hmm. uh, Sonia Cassidy, who who has a lot of experience managing people and and operations in in other uh, companies. But yes, certainly, if we we grow rapidly, then we would need more. Reminds me, I, I don't know how big you are now. How many staff do you have? And like, what does your budget look like? So the team is around uh, nine people, but many of them are volunteers. So at this point, it's two or three full-time equivalent. Yeah. So uh, what are some kind of alternative careers that people could pursue in, you know, science or or in or in government or perhaps other areas of academia that that are that are relevant to alternative foods? Yeah. One one I haven't mentioned was uh, biology, of course, because many um, of these alternate foods involve biological organisms. Certainly, government jobs could potentially influence uh, funding for alternate foods and also preparedness planning. Climate science is relevant. I think it's a little less neglected than the actual work on alternate foods, but there are some things that would be useful on that. And and political science, uh, I think I mentioned with uh, economics as well, but thinking about uh, how much cooperation we might get in these different scenarios. Uh, do, do you have any um, view on this issue of uh, whether it's if someone wants to work on alternative foods, whether they should uh, kind of go and work for all fed and, and related projects or um, whether they should uh, do earning to give if, if you're particularly short on money or like fundraising? Fundraising is one of the bottlenecks that you face. Yeah, it, at this point, we we do have a number of collaborators who are willing to uh, work on this project um, and have the relevant skills, but we're we're mainly lacking funding at this point. And so, uh, yeah, I would encourage people to, to consider that, that option uh, if they wanted to help out with this to, to make money to donate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always kind of hard to get a new organization or project off the ground. Are there any uh, people who've been particularly helpful, uh, perhaps uh, would be able to help other people get other projects off the ground? Well, yeah, it's, I'd certainly like to acknowledge the, the efforts of the, the rest of the AllFed team, um, donors, including... Uh, Center for Effective Altruism through an EA grant, Adam Gleave through the EA lottery, Jacob Trefethen, uh Greg Colburn, and, and Ben West, and a number of other donors. So we appreciate all the support we've received. Yeah. How, how did you manage to kind of, kind of find those, the people who are willing to give you, give you the very first donations to, to get things rolling? It's been quite a bit. There's been quite a bit of response to the uh, EA forum posts that I've that I've made, kind of both scoping out the effectiveness of the cause area, but then specifically looking at you know what what all Fed can do. What's the biggest mistake you think uh, all Fed has has made so far? I would say that early on we had this idea of having an essay contest with cash prizes for people to think of additional alternate foods or, or maybe contribute in some way to the idea. And our idea was to get more people interested in it. And we actually contacted uh, several hundred agricultural departments around the world with this essay contest. Uh, but overall, uh, we didn't get nearly as many submissions as we'd hoped for and, and didn't really turn into much follow-up work. So it, it, it turned out to be a mistake in retrospect, uh, though I am optimistic about uh, the effective thesis that we've uh, put a bunch of all fed related theses on cool yeah we'll we'll stick up a link to that all right uh, let's move on now from feeding the world and and all fed to uh, you know bigger bigger picture career issues and and other things you've done 
One thing that I can't help but notice is just that uh, it seems like you've been extremely creative uh, in thinking of all of these ideas and, and extremely open-minded. You've been willing to go places that most people wouldn't just because they think it's it's too strange. How do you come up with these ideas and, and figure out which ones to, to continue pursuing? Well, it's it's been a, a long history. Like uh, even starting in sixth grade, I started <laughs> having a list of my inventions and I've accumulated over a thousand of them so far. And uh, I do have a patent on uh, on a heat exchanger at this point. And my other potential route to impact is making lots of money on a patent and <laughs> uh, and donating lots of that. Uh, but it's it certainly is much more competitive. Uh, many many people are are trying to do the same thing. But I think that the the skills of of being creative and just not not accepting the status quo, you know, not saying oh if it ain't broke don't fix it say like how can we do this better i mean okay yes we could solve the problem if we spent trillions of dollars on stored food but that's Mm. not going to happen so we don't really have a solution we need to be able to do better and yeah basically just not not accepting that and and continually thinking that uh that there are solutions out there we just need to find them yeah have you had to deal with a lot of people saying that you know that's just really weird or you know perhaps not taking your work seriously because it's not in the mainstream well, certainly the first reaction is <laughs> you want to feed everyone when the sun's black? That's impossible. <laughs> uh, but then I say, well, I try to take them through the, the numbers. But yeah, I'm, I'm certainly open to to any other feedback on, on why it might not work and I might have more work to do. Do, do you think that the effective altruism community maybe doesn't have enough engineers? I don't, I don't know a whole lot of engineers and it seems like you, you bring a particular worldview. Yeah, I think it was 7% in the okay. latest EA survey that was engineers, which okay. is not maybe, negligible. It's not so bad. But I think that we do need a lot more problem solving. I mean, of course, we need to be aware of the problems, but that's not enough. We need to actually solve problems, and that's what engineers do. And and I think that's illustrated by this, this paper written by a scientist saying like, oh, well, you know, humans are going to go extinct and that's what's going to happen. <laughs> and engineers say, no, no, we're going <laughs> we're gonna, to we're gonna solve that problem. <laughs> I guess it seems like just part of your method is to just do the maths and then just follow it to its conclusions and, and accept it, even if it's if it's counterintuitive. Would, would you say that that's right? Yeah, that, that's right. That's kind of a common way of summing it up when, yeah. when people say it's impossible. And I say, well, look at the numbers <laughs> and then see, see if you think it's impossible. Yeah. Has that ever led you astray, uh, perhaps, where you've like, investigated something that was impl- implausible on its face and then it looked to you like it was good when you did the maths and then it turned out actually that common sense was right after all? Oh, certainly many of my inventions uh, have turned out to be impossible, especially when uh, when I was younger, or, or just impractical, or invented by someone else. So there, there's a huge amount of failure involved uh, in, in inventing. And I, I guess that's the other thing I would say, that you have to be not afraid of failing yeah. uh, if you want to take on these, these really hard problems. But my attitude is, oh, okay, well, I found something that doesn't work. Well, I'll, I'll focus on the ones that might. Yeah. So, so um, I love that you've got a, got a scrapbook of a, of a thousand different ideas for inventions that you've had. What, what are some of the most promising ones or at least the most interesting ones? Well, I'd say at this point, the most promising is, is the heat exchanger. Actually, for my uh, dissertation, I invented a new type of heat exchanger. And heat exchangers transfer heat between liquids and gases. And so they're used in all sorts of applications like refrigerators and cars and power plants and it's it's a crowded field many many thousands of papers but i thought of a way of manufacturing heat exchangers more cheaply and so they're what are called uh micro channel heat exchangers that have small channels and they have a lot of advantages that they use less material but they're very expensive to manufacture and so I found a way that, that we might actually be able to mass produce them. And so as a part of my dissertation, found out about heat exchangers or started getting interested in them because of an application that is uh, solar water pasteurization. Uh, and so in less developed countries where you have no water treatment, millions of people, many children, mostly children, uh, die because of water uh, contamination. And all we need to do is just heat up the water to about... 150 degrees Fahrenheit, 65 degrees Celsius, to kill those germs. You actually don't need to boil it. And so you can do this in a, in a really simple solar cooker or solar oven. But what makes the system much better is if you use a heat exchanger to take that solar energy heated water 
to preheat the incoming cold water, and then you don't need nearly as much solar energy. And because it's not that high temperature, I thought, well, the way of making it really cheap would be making the heat exchanger out of plastics. So I learned about laser welding of plastics, and I saw this technique of, of laser welding clear plastics together. So I flew to Chicago where they did this and with a bunch of clear plastic uh, samples, but none of them worked. And at that point, I had exhausted my free laser welding time. So I was paying the guy $200 an hour to drive to Walmart and buy hefty garbage bags. And that's actually what worked. Oh, and uh, what, what, Why do they work? So it wasn't complete luck. I had done some calculations on using... Uh, opaque material. It just meant that the laser was absorbed and then had to conduct downward versus the laser passing through the clear plastic and then conducting upward. But yeah, you, you could say I built my dissertation on hefty garbage bags. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have any time to try to commercialize that or, or spread the word about it? Yeah. So I, I do actually uh, own the patent at this point and I've licensed it to a company, uh, Academic Technology Ventures, that is basically commercializes uh, academic inventions. And so we're, we're talking with companies that use heat exchangers to uh, hopefully actually get it made. And I've done several prototypes, but you know, actually get it mass produced. What's the um, biggest impediment to, to scaling it up? As I mentioned, it's, it involves laser welding, mm. uh, which is expensive if you do just one at a time. But if you do a continuous process or a roll-to-roll -roll process, then you can reduce the cost per heat exchanger, but that means a large capital investment. So I see. there are also other ways of, of joining it, like uh, inkjet printing of adhesives. So it's like your printer, but you're printing glue. Hmm. And, and that could join the, the pattern, join the layers together. And it could also be used for, for metals as well. I just haven't done that, that prototype. So, so yeah, basically, we need to find that near-term application that would actually justify the capital investment to, to make it at low cost. Yeah, so I saw uh, recently uh, that you posted on the Effective Altruism Forum about how you'd gotten uh, a paper published about how to uh, potentially uh, prevent or reduce the, the scale of supervolcanic eruptions, which sounds uh, really amazing. Uh, I really would have thought that there's nothing much that we could do about supervolcanic explosions. But once, once again, you look at that and just see an engineering problem. If I remember correctly, you came up with uh, something like 50 possible interventions that might be able to stop supervolcanoes from, from blowing up. Yeah, e either prevent it from exploding or somehow mitigate the, the impact of the, of the explosion. So yeah, this is another example that there's just conventional wisdom that we can't do anything about it. Uh, there have been a couple papers that, that have considered the possibility, but I think there were five total interventions suggested. Uh, so it increased it by an, an order of magnitude. And it wasn't just me, I actually had a co-author who was a geologist uh, unfortunately, he has uh, has died since. But yeah, the, the, I think the easiest one to explain and probably the most cost effective is that the way a geyser works is you have this hot water under pressure in, in the earth. And once you get to a certain temperature, the water starts boiling. And then you get all these bubbles. And then all of a sudden, there's less pressure pushing down on the water, which means it boils even more rapidly. So you get this chain reaction and you get a geyser. Hmm. Well, the supervolcano actually works similarly, though it's not water boiling. And so my idea was, well, we could at least delay the supervolcano by just putting more pressure on it. And the cheapest thing would just be piling some dirt on it. And in the paper, I only talked about technical feasibility. I didn't do economics, but I, I do have some, some non-public economic estimates that, that indicate it could be cost-effective uh, even just with the present generation considered, but it's it's a lot more expensive than alternate food, and it only addresses supervolcanoes, whereas alternate food address other risks. So it, it really can't compare in cost effectiveness to alternate mm -hmm. foods, and so that's why I've, I've focused most of my efforts on on those. But in the longer term, it's something that we might imagine doing once we've taken the lower hanging fruit elsewhere. Right. So the idea is you just find a supervolcano that you worry might explode, and then just pack tons of dirt on it, and then hope that that you put a lid on it. Yeah. Now, of course, there's the concern that that might make the eventual eruption even stronger. Yeah. And so I have just estimated how much you might need to do to delay it 100 years, because I figure after 100 years, we will be hopefully much more technologically mature and then we can figure something else out. Yeah. What, what were some of the other approaches? Uh, one of the original suggestions was, can't we just generate geothermal electricity from this hot volcano mm. and and also reduce the risk, which would be 
a, a win-win. One problem is that the, the actual magma chamber is fairly far down, so you have to drill a long ways if you're going to do it quickly. Normally, we wouldn't drill that far, and there, therefore it would take a long time for the heat to conduct. Whereas I was interested in what can we do to reduce the risk in one decade? But it is, it is possible if we have drilled that far and we have drilled to very high temperatures, but it would still require more investigation to see how feasible that is. Some other ones were, it, it might actually be more economical just to vent the steam than actually generate geothermal electricity, which sounds like a waste. But if you look at Yellowstone in the U.S., it's pretty far away from population centers. So yeah, you can power the people nearby, but at some point it becomes more expensive than other ways of providing electricity. And so at that point, you might just want to vent the steam. Yeah. How hard is it to, to vent a supervolcano? Well, if you want to do it quickly to actually get more safety quickly, then you got to drill down close to it. And the other problem is that you might actually incite the eruption, which obviously uh. we want to avoid. So <laughs> in the paper, I try to do some qualitative like technical feasibility, but also how risky is it? And I think something like piling dirt on the surface is not very risky. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like it happens naturally with snow or even with um, glacial advances and retreats. Hmm. And so that's actually one analogy we use that it looks like uh, glacial retreats, you know, might actually reduce the probability of supervolcanoes or, or glacial advances. So it might provide evidence that this is already working. Were there any more uh, counterintuitive uh, ways of preventing supervolcano explosions? Or was it was it largely just, you know, put pressure on it or vent it? That's mainly it. I mean, I also put in very speculative things of what we could do during an eruption, but the eruption is so powerful that those solutions would be way more expensive. So it was kind of just like, for completeness, write down all the possible ideas, but <laughs> we should focus on the ones that are most feasible. Yeah. So there's no way of capturing the material that gets thrown up. So there were a couple of different classes, like, you know, could you somehow stop an eruption in progress well that would be very difficult but maybe we could have some way of disrupting the plume because you have all this sulfur dioxide emitted and if it gets all the way to the stratosphere then you get the long-term climate impact but if you could somehow disrupt the plume mix it somehow or cool it down or, or whatever then maybe it wouldn't get up to the up to the stratosphere and then you'd still have local impacts but you wouldn't have that global cooling yeah, another interesting story that um, you mentioned in the in the notes to prepare for this interview was that uh, you'd been involved in a team that had done some energy efficiency analysis to, to help make policy and found that spending a million dollars on some things that they'd identified could save a billion dollars worth of worth of energy. C can you expand on that? Right. So the team was was called Research and Policy at this company, uh, Ecos, uh, eventually called Ecova. And the the idea was to look at areas that were neglected in energy efficiency. So random small appliances. Uh, so the particular study was based on uh, external power supplies that convert alternating current to direct current uh, for computers. And most people have thought, oh, well, there's these tiny things. They don't use very much energy. And how the heck would we regulate them anyway? Well, what we figured out uh, and this was actually a, a little before my time, but then continued doing research on other projects uh, when I was there, was for the case of external power supplies, we could do a regulation that applied to all the power supplies, regardless of what product they were powering. And they developed a test procedure to measure how energy efficient they were, and then tore them apart and found out why the efficient ones were more efficient and how much more they cost and made the case to the California Energy Commission to make a standard, and then demonstrated that this was cost-effective energy savings. And then the US Department of Energy basically adopted that standard for, for the whole country. And so this was you know, less than a million dollars total to do this, this whole project over a period of quite a few years. And then, of course, it's tempting to say, oh, the team made these external power supplies more efficient and we're gonna save energy for decades. But that's not realistic because it probably would have eventually happened. So really the analysis only looked at a few year acceleration and still it saved a billion dollars worth of energy. That's incredible. What's, what's the underlying lesson here that I guess if you can get in early in something that's growing and work on standardization, then potentially you can have a, you know, get, get, get extraordinary leverage? 
Yeah, and generally, you know, use the the A rule of of neglectedness that, you know, maybe there are some things like foot massagers that are neglected because they don't use very much energy, but other things are neglected and and the energy use really does add up. So it's worth Mm. spending some effort on it. Yeah. Do do you know why no one else was was looking at this? For example, the, the people who make these appliances? Generally, the manufacturers have an incentive to make the lowest cost product. And because there wasn't any labeling, like consumers had no idea how efficient they were. There really wasn't a market incentive to make them more efficient. Mm, so there could be a lot of low-hanging fruit there. Right. Are there any other interesting stories or, or ideas that you've had throughout your career that, that you'd like to talk about? Well, I guess, I guess on that team, the, the other projects we've worked on involved TVs, computers, uh, clothes dryers is another one uh, that I spent a lot of my time on. Uh, everyone just assumed that you can't do anything about clothes dryers, but actually Europe has shown that, that you can, instead of just having electric resistance dryers that are basically like a toaster, uh, you can use a heat pump, which is uh, running an air conditioner in reverse, basically, to provide the heat, and that's a lot more efficient. Unfortunately, it's more expensive and, and uh, a slower drying, so actually what I focused more on was putting a heat exchanger on a dryer, because you have this warm air, and you might as well use that to preheat the, the incoming cold air. Is it just the case that uh, if, if you're an engineer, uh, you just notice ideas for inventions all around you all the time? Or is this kind of a more, more distinctive Dave Denkenberger thing? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've taught a class that's engineering design. And, you know, we generally encourage students to say, well, what are you dissatisfied with? You know, where are the problems and can you improve on it? I think uh, I've been fortunate to to really take that to the extreme and, and always always be thinking about it and make sure I write down ideas right away. I mean, one of the things I, I always had, uh, I started using voice recognition software uh, back in the year 2000. And one of the big reasons why I did it was because I, I bought a voice recorder. So when I was walking around campus and I had an idea, I could just <laughs> dictate it and then keep walking. I wouldn't lose any time. And then I'd come back and, and transcribe it on the computer. So, so do you use uh, speech recognition on your computer all the time now? Yeah, I do. Uh, and, and part of the reason was because I, I had some wrist issues. But, but even though I've actually finally uh, addressed my wrist issues, uh, it's still, if you're dictating more than a sentence, it's just, it's just faster. I mean, you can go over 100 words per minute easily, even including the, uh, the time of correcting it. Now, before the year 2000, the main value of uh, speech recognition was laughing at the words it came up with. <laughs> but after that, and you could actually talk full speed and, and it, it took into account con- contextual cues, uh, it's gotten you know, 99% accurate. Interesting. Yeah, I've found voice recognition on my phone really, really terrible. But do I just have a strange voice? So maybe it hasn't hasn't adapted to how I sound? Yeah, the, the big advantage of on the computer is that you actually tell it what accent you have, mm. and you train it for about 10 minutes. So it's already customized. And then when it makes a mistake, you can correct it, you use some big vocabulary word that it's saying no, an, an average person is not going to say this. Well, but when you train it, then it gets it right the next time. Um, so it's just, it's much more powerful than, than on the phone. Right. Interesting. So do you, do you want to, do you want to mention what software you use in case someone wants to give that a go? Uh, yeah, I use Dragon naturally speaking. And do you have problems with, you know, punctuation and, you know, uh, putting in unusual marks and so on? Does that slow you down? Uh, I do dictate punctuation and I'm proud to say that in normal conversation, I have never said period at the end of a sentence. <laughs> well done. So, yeah, are there any advice you'd like to give to, to listeners about, you know, how to come up with, with ideas or just, just other advice on how to have more, more impact with, with their career that you've learned? You know, some, some people will say, think about an idea when you're going to sleep and then maybe you'll come up with a solution. I, I haven't really found that so much, but, you know, if it works for you, that's fine. General advice. Well, I, I've been interested in, in uh, effective volunteering. I think that you can have a big impact that way, that there are a lot of, of tasks that, that can be done by volunteers. And, and maybe alternate foods is, is easier than, than other things. That mm-hmm. There are a lot of people with transferable skills. Like you don't have to learn a ton about AI, for instance, uh, mm-hmm. to be able to contribute. And, and thinking about volunteering, I think that there's a lower barrier. Like there are many more people that volunteer 10% of their time, of their free time, than people who give 10% of their money. And yet, if you do it well, you could have similar impact. And another thing I've thought about, uh, which I I would recommend 80,000 hours to pursue, is that there are some careers that there's a lot of downtime, that you can, I don't know, whatever, be a security guard or something, 
but you could be doing effective volunteering uh, and still fulfill the obligations of your career. So if you think about it, if, if you had a 40 hour per week job nominally, but, but were able to volunteer for something else 20 hours a week, that would be like 50% of your time. That could be a huge impact. Do you think that there are other ways to reduce existential risk that you can you can just do with with engineering approaches? That that's something I think we haven't recommended that that many people go into engineering because we mostly haven't thought that the long term future is going to turn on it on engineering questions. But maybe, maybe we're wrong about that. I definitely am am looking at that because I think it is neglected, and I would like to learn more about other existential risks and and see where that that might uh, be a good strategy. But yeah, it would be great to have more people doing the same thing. So what was your path to, to working on, on this uh, cause of, of food security? What, what kind of things did you, did you work on before and, and why did you eventually uh, shift? Well, in, in high school, I learned about global poverty and, and how much could be done, like $50 could uh, provide a year's worth of elementary education in Haiti. And at, at that point, I knew that I didn't want to have a lot of luxuries and I wanted to, to donate uh, a lot of money, and also to do high impact research to have direct impact. And so, I focused quite a bit on global poverty. Uh, actually, overlapped with with Peter Singer when I was at Princeton. Uh, gave a, a sermon at my Unitarian Universalist church on on donating to to global poverty, and then started working on uh, animal welfare issues around 2007 or so. And by by 2010, I was uh, convinced by the importance of existential risk. But interestingly, it wasn't then because of the long-term future, because I had had some economics training and and many economists uh, discount the long-term future, but I found that it it could be cost-effective even with the present generation, and it could be of overwhelming uh, importance if you think about the number of computer consciousnesses that, that we could produce even very quickly, like in 100 years. So, so then I, I, I moved towards the, uh, the existential risk area. It's extremely admirable that you've done this analysis and thought that, uh, you know, figured out that all fed is, is, is very cost effective. And that caused you to just start giving 50% of your, of your income to, to fund all fed yourself. Uh, how have you found that? How do people react to that? And, and have you found that that's um, been, been a burden or, or do, you, do you find it really motivating to be funding your own project? When I was doing the cost effective analysis, at first I thought, yeah, you know, this is cost effective. That's, that's great. But then when I did the number of how many expected lives could be saved for every day accelerated that we actually get prepared, and it was 100 to 40,000 lives, I said, I have, to, I have to actually donate now. You know, this is, this is the cause that I've been looking for. And so that has enabled me I mean, I, I can do a lot of the research, but by funding all Fed, I'm able to pay people with other skills that can advance the, the overall effort much faster than if I were just trying to do it myself. Well, yeah, uh, thanks, so, thanks so much for all of the work that you're, that you're doing to improve the world. And, and, and I really appreciate the, the creativity that you've brought to the table. Uh, not, not so many people are willing to, to explore these, uh, these unusual uh, ways of improving the world. Well, thank you. And thank you for your work. I'm a fan of the podcast. So it's been great to be a guest. <laughs> we, we, we both appreciate one another's work. It's uh, <laughs> un, un, unsurprising, perhaps. Um, my guest today has been uh, Dave Denkenberger. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Dave. Thanks, Rob. Dave just wanted me to point out uh, two things that he got wrong in this episode. Apparently, the frequency of supervolcanoes is more like every 10 to 100,000 years, not every 100,000 to a million years, as he said in the episode. Also, on the fly, Dave incorrectly converted 40 gallons to 120 litres instead of the correct 150 litres. Also, interestingly, uh, we looked at the most recent effective altruism survey, which indicated that about 6% of respondents actually had an engineering background. So it seems like engineers actually probably aren't all that underrepresented. This episode is coming out around Christmas, which is a moment that a lot of people have to decide where they're going to make their donations, at least if they live in the United States, because they want to get them out before the new tax year. Uh, if you would like some advice on how to have the largest impact with your giving, uh, 80,000 Hours has an article on the best way to decide where to give, uh, which I'll link to in the show notes and the blog post attached to the show. I haven't spent enough time looking into all Fed to either recommend or discourage a donation, but I'll link to a writer on the Effective Altruism Forum who did investigate it in some substantial detail two months ago and wrote up what they concluded. If you decide you would like to give or learn more about it, the site again is allfed.info. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining.
talk to you in a week or two.